on behalf of both UC Berkeley and the entire uh, University of California system, including our Citrus partners in particular, I'm delighted to welcome you to Citrus Symposium 2006, Engineering a Better World. As a physicist, I might retitle it Shankar, Engineering and scientific a <laughs> Better World. But, uh, of course, as you know, we have a terrific group here, uh, faculty, students, alumni, corporate partners, friends and volunteers, uh, and campus leaders. And I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, one of our finest colleagues and my very good friend, Dean Richard Newton, uh, is not able to join us here today because he's currently dealing with some medical issues. Uh, and I talked to Rich yesterday, and I'm quite confident that uh, if anybody can deal with these issues, it's Rich, and that, that we will look forward to, uh, to his rapid recovery. Uh, he's been in the hospital at UCSF and uh, uh, was just discharged uh, yesterday. And so Rich sends his best wishes to all of you and looks forward to being back on campus soon. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce another person I've become very good, had the good fortune of becoming very good friends with uh, in a short length of time, and that's the uh, rising, I guess it's called, uh, uh, chairman, new chair of the regents, uh, and also one of our own graduates, and also the uh, uh, creator uh, in part of the concept and also in providing resources for the newly founded Blum Center for Developing Economies, uh, which I call, when I talk to people, when Richard's not in the room, the Blum Center for the Alleviation of Global Poverty. The two are isomorphous with each other, which is a really wonderful new exciting venture here at Cal in which, in which uh, engineering generally and Citrus in particular uh, is playing and will, and will in the future even more so play a really critical role. Dick. Well, thank you, uh, Chancellor. And uh, it, it's not that I didn't know much about citrus until recently, and somebody explained to me it wasn't tangerines, lemons, and oranges. Um, but uh, I think one of the interesting concepts that uh, Bob Dines and the chancellors and others ha have talked about uh, really is the idea of being one university and 10 campuses. And I guess citrus in many ways uh, has led uh, the university in that direction because I guess you've been up operating for about five years. And it's really Rich Newton um, who, better than anybody, articulated what is now uh, going to be the strategy of our new center. Uh, uh, it's, I call it the Center for Developing Economies because everything else gets called global poverty. And I got tired of hearing it, and I just thought developing economies sounded a little more upbeat. But um, where part of our mission really is to encourage a broad range of students to take an interest in the three billion people on the planet who live on two dollars a day or less, a lot of what we want to do uh, is specific projects uh, for the university faculty and students where we have a competitive advantage, and that clearly is in technology and science. And um, Rich is really the one who said, look, uh, instead of just going to villages and uh, uh, poor countries and saying, how can we help you, why don't we look at science and technical, uh, technological innovation and say, what can we do in these new developing fields that can change people's lives for the better. So I, I think that uh, we will be working with you uh, in the future in, with my other hat on uh, as chairman of the Board of Regents, uh, just to let you know that anything I can ever do to help you, uh, I'd like to be as helpful as I can because I think what you're doing is really important not only to the to the uh, university, to our state, but really to the nation and the world as a whole. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Dick. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Fiona Doyle, who is a Cambridge-educated material, uh, material science and engineer, scientist and engineer, who's uh, been on the Cal faculty since 1983. Uh, she's been doing a great job uh, in the role of acting dean for the past month, uh, and we're really grateful for her efforts there. Fiona, can you please come to the podium? Thank you very much, Chancellor Bergenau. Thank you. On behalf of our students and faculty and our Citrus community across all four um, UC campuses that are participating, I'd like to welcome everybody to the 2006 Citrus Symposium. We're really thrilled to have such a wonderful group of UC friends, alumni, faculty and students, um, benefactors and partners. I'm so glad that you're here today. I'd like to, first of all, take a moment to let you know about this afternoon's program. As you can see, um, we're going to have three sessions. In the first session, we're going to have a panel discussion with Chancellor Bob Bergenau and other distinguished guests. Then we'll hear from Shankar Sastri, who will be giving us a brief report on the Citrus program. Then Paul Wright will be discussing global energy, and Eric Brewer will be sharing his work bringing helpful technologies to emerging regions around the world. Finally, we're going to move over to Hearst Mining Building for wine and refreshments. And there you're going to have an opportunity to meet our incredible students, who are really the lifeblood of the Citrus effort. Um, as they share their work on Citrus projects with um, interactive exhibits, intriguing new gadgets and simulations, you're going to have a chance to see firsthand just how the Citrus research is really impacting education and developing the potential of our students. So now, let me say a few words about citrus itself for those of you who still think it's a kind of fruit. <laughs> the overall goal for citrus has always been about maximizing impact for our educational and research programs at UC. It was launched in 2001. Citrus is a public-private partnership. It's headquartered at Berkeley, but our <coughs> UC partners are UC Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz, and all are actively involved. Today we're celebrating the achievements of five years, can you believe it, of Citrus, recognizing some of the key individuals who've helped make this happen. Critical to the success of Citrus from its earliest days has been the leadership support that we've received from generous private benefactors and corporate partners. Many of you are here today and we're so grateful that you could join us. We're thrilled that the new headquarters for Citrus is now under construction. That's the building site behind here, if you um, saw that on the way in. Here you'll see the artist's rendition of what the building's going to look like when it's completed in 2009. It's obviously going to be a wonderful facility. Um, what I'd like to do now is introduce you to some of our leadership investors in the Citrus program. They're inspiring individuals. I'm going to focus on just a few of them today. After I've introduced these individuals, um, I'm going to ask those who are here today if they'll stand so that we can all recognize them and their contributions. To begin with, we have three couples who've made cornerstone investments in the Citrus headquarters building. Dado and Maria Banatow, whose three children all earned um, degrees at Cal. Maria is active with the UC Berkeley Foundation trustees, and Dado has founded several successful high-tech companies and Tallwood Venture Capital. Sehat Sutaja and Waley Dai are both alumni of the college. They're two of the three founders of Marvell Semiconductor, which is a very high successful high-tech company. Sehat serves as Marvell's chairman, president, and CEO. Whaley is Marvell's chief operating officer. And their son is an engineering student at Cal, I should say in my own department, material science and engineering. Pontus Sutaja and Ting Chuk. Pontus is Sehat's brother, and he's the third of the three Marvell founders. 
Puntus served as Marvell's chief technology officer. Both Ting and Puntus are active, involved alumni of the College of Engineering. Then we have Stephen D. Bechtel, Jr. He's chairman emeritus of the Bechtel Group, and he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, recognizing his many contributions to the engineering field. Next, we have Jean and Floyd Kwame. They're long-term supporters of the College of Engineering. In addition to that, Floyd serves on the College Advisory Board and earned his engineering degree here. James and Catherine Lau are both alumni of the College of Engineering. Catherine's active with the UC Berkeley Foundation trustees, and James is the founder of a successful Silicon Valley company, Network Appliance. Qualcomm, as I'm sure you know, is a successful wireless telecommunications company, which has made a cornerstone commitment to the Citrus Building. Pictured here is CEO Paul Jacobs, and all three of his degrees are from the College of Engineering. Then we have John and Nancy Neerhout, and John's daughter Cheryl, and together they're making a leadership gift to the Citrus headquarters. Both John and Cheryl are alumni of the College of Engineering, and John serves on our advisory board. Many of these generous supporters are with us today. And at this point, I'd like to ask you all if you could stand so that we can recognize you. For leading benefactors who've done so much for the University of California, we on the Berkeley campus would like to honor and recognize them in a lasting way. And in this spirit, I'm proud to announce today that the Citrus program on the UC Berkeley campus will henceforth be known as the Banatow Institute at Citrus, recognizing the pivotal leadership support provided by Dado and Maria Banatow. The Banatow Institute at Citrus focuses on high-impact cross-disciplinary educational and research programs with linkages to many academic programs, both in the college and beyond. I'm also pleased to announce that our Center for Global Learning and Outreach from Berkeley Engineering, known as GLOBE, has been named the Banatow GLOBE Center. This exciting new program is creating international partnerships in both education and research and increasing our global impact as a college and a campus. This shows the central location of the new Citrus Headquarters building, which will form the new nexus point and community hub for the entire College of Engineering and for all of Citrus. And in recognition of the extraordinary leadership investment of the founders of Marvell Semiconductor and their families, Sehat and Whaley, Pontus and Ting, whose photos you just saw, I'm extremely proud to announce that the Citrus Headquarters building will henceforth be known as Sataja Dai Hall. We will also name our new central laboratory in the Citrus Building, the Marvell Nanofabrication Laboratory. This is a two-story facility that will support cutting-edge projects in microfabrication and nanofabrication. Here we see the Qualcomm Cyber Cafe, which is named to recognize Qualcomm's leadership support of the Citrus project. This is going to be a 24-7 operation so that students can fortify themselves during their, um, long, their all night projects. You can see that the exterior of the Qualcomm Cyber Cafe has a lovely view of the Campanile. Um, here we have a rendition of the Stephen D. Bechtel Jr. Conference Room with its beautiful view of San Francisco Bay and the Golden Gate Bridge. This is obviously a lovely space. Um, it'll be used for meetings and seminars, and we anticipate that the view will inspire all to new heights of scholarship and innovation. I've shared a few examples of some of the planned recognitions for Citrus. These few examples have hopefully given you a feeling for how these exciting efforts are coming to life. Let me just take a couple of minutes to update you on the progress of the building project.
The project was approved by the regions in May 2006. So thank you, Dick Blum, for your efforts there. Construction began just a few weeks later, and we anticipate completion by January 2009. So to summarize, what I see is really important in Citrus is the fact that it's transforming engineering education in the broadest sense by its clear vision to work on large societal scale challenges such as energy and healthcare. This vision is being embraced by our, our students, and it's not just our graduate students. The undergraduates are really enthusiastic about this new high impact vision. A lot of them are already getting involved in Citrus projects in our laboratories. It's really exciting to see. And I really believe that going forward, Citrus is going to be pivotal, pivotal in helping us to recruit some of the brightest young minds in California to come to Berkeley and to work as undergraduates on some of these projects. So on behalf of our wonderful students, I'd really like to say to all of you, thank you so much for your support in making Citrus a reality. And it's now an honor for me to introduce our distinguished panel who will be discussing the topic, the role of university research in California's future. Our panel moderator will be journalism dean Orville Schell. Our panelists will be Berkeley Chancellor Robert Bergenau, Berkeley Vice Chancellor of Research Beth Burnside, the Citrus Director Shankar Sastry, and David Tenenhaus, who's the Vice President of A9.com. So could the panelists please take their places on the stage. Great. Can we, uh, can we uh, need to leave? Yeah, that's great. great. Well, while the panelists are uh, taking their seats, uh, I'm Orville Schell. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see you all here. I have to say that my own school is on the road, the dead end road that leads to the great hole, which is slowly being filled to create the Citrus Building. And normally, uh, one might take umbrage at the endless traffic of trucks, but each time I hear one, I think to myself, well, this is a, in, in, in the name of a very good cause, and in a certain cryptic way, uh, it makes me uh, feel quite glad. And I'm really pleased to be able to be here. Sorry, Rich Newton isn't, uh, but to substitute for him. The task at hand is really uh, this for our, our, our panel today. Uh, Rich Newton had a notion of the idea of a DMZ, a kind of a demilitarized zone where industry, academic uh, endeavors, and uh, 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 government uh, efforts could all get together, a sort of a commons. And I think it's a very interesting idea, uh, a, a, a place that really your universities need to uh, uh, make a greater effort to occupy. Um, what is sort of interesting about the role of Citrus, I think, is the fact that it represents a piece of a whole new rearrangement of research and development uh, landscape. Uh, a new piece that has as its final goal actually applying some of these technologies in society. And that's really what we're here to consider today. How has this landscape changed? What is the role of universities today? And what is the role going to be of this rather extraordinary new multi-campus creation, uh, Citrus? So let's start right off. We're asking the panelists to briefly uh, sort of throw out some ideas in addressing the question of the new landscape, the new food chain, if you will, of idea to development to research and finally to application that Citrus uh, represents. So we'll start with uh, Chancellor uh, Bergenau. Thank you. Thank you, Orville. Uh, this is an issue which, as you can imagine, we spent a lot of time uh, thinking and which happens to connect very directly with my own personal career. Uh, I, I began my career as an independent scientist, as an experimental solid state physicist at Bell Laboratories in 1968. Uh, and at that time, uh, Bell Laboratories was really the mecca for fundamental uh, uh, scientific investigations in the, in the uh, uh, properties of materials and chemistry and information science, et cetera. 
it was truly an extraordinary place, and it was really a, uh, an, an inspiring uh, time in life. Uh, uh, the probably the freest environment I have ever found myself in, in terms of being able to uh, pursue fundamental uh, problems in science without any concern about either your salary or about your research funding. Uh, Bell Laboratories was not alone at that time. Uh, at that time, IBM in Yorktown Heights and in IBM Zurich, et cetera, uh, had wonderful research labs. Just south of Bell Laboratories in New Jersey was RCA Laboratories. Uh, out in the West Coast, there was Xerox and Xerox Park, where just transformative research took place, et cetera. There was a long list of, of great industrial research laboratories which spanned the spectrum from fundamental investigations to, to uh, quite applied research. The laser diode, which underlies CD players, et cetera, right, uh, came, came out, of these, out of these institutions. In addition to that, and for my own personal research, uh, also, the kind of research I did accessed facilities at the large national laboratories. So in addition to the great industrial research laboratories, we also had great national laboratories. During the period I was at Bell Labs, seven or eight years, running experiments at Brookhaven, there were three separate experiments, unfortunately not mine, uh, taking place at Brookhaven, which subsequently won the Nobel Prize. Uh, uh, five of six, no, seven of my colleagues at Bell Laboratories won the Nobel Prize. Uh, in addition to then the great national laboratories, which uh, uh, did terrific fundamental research. Of course, then there was also the universities. So we had this three stool, uh, or three leg stool of industrial research laboratories, the national laboratories, and universities. In my, of course, as a result of the consent decree and a variety of business decisions, although we still have uh, industrial laboratories, their character is totally different. And especially for very long-range uh, research, it hasn't completely disappeared, but it really looks nothing like it did in the 60s. Uh, and we have, still have the national laboratories, uh, but with the prominent exception of Lawrence Berkeley Lab and one or two others, they no longer are preeminent in the way that they were several decades ago. Uh, and then we have great industrial laboratories, but almost inevitably focused on much shorter-term uh, short, shorter term issues, uh, as I said already. So really, the landscape has changed dramatically uh, in a way which, in my view, has really increased significantly the importance of universities carrying out long-range research and development in direct partnership with industry, uh, translating knowledge created in universities into the marketplace. And so we really have a new paradigm now which Citrus is, of course, a major player, but which, in my opinion, is not fully developed and which we need to continue to work on. Thank you, uh, Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Bergeno. Uh, next, we have David Tenenhaus, and uh, maybe uh, you could offer some perspective from the private side of what you, how you see the relationship of universities to, to uh, startups, technology firms such as you've been involved. Thank you. Definitely my pleasure, and uh, some in the audience will probably realize that and are aware that uh, prior to being associated with Amazon A9, I was involved with uh, Intel Research and really organizing industrial research around a, a different model than Bell Labs had, one that was uh, very much focused on intense collaboration with the universities, uh, particularly the UC system, uh, but also others. And uh, I, I think the chancellors uh, really hit it. The, the, in some sense, what I, the way I think of this is the genie has escaped the Bell Labs bottle. And that, yes, Bell Labs was extremely effective uh, in, in the research it did. It generated a certain no number of Nobel Prizes, tremendous insights, uh, as did the other sort of great industrial research labs. But the vast bulk of the time, the truly great discoveries were actually in the wrong place in the sense that they were in the context of a company that couldn't fully take advantage of those discoveries. So we had an inherent inefficiency in the system um, that is, I think, uh, wonderfully addressed when uh, the fundamental and basic discovery engine is university. The discoveries can then flow directly to uh, where they can most effectively be used. Um, and so I think that, um, that this trans transition uh, from a small number of corporate research labs to essentially much larger number of researchers based in a much more public forum is, is, is a really positive one. Um, and uh, I, I think it's far too late to go back. And I think that's a wonderful thing. 
Uh, in many of these fields, we have uh, many more researchers than we did before. I'm a networking researcher, and, and even in networking, which should have been Bell Labs' specialty, uh, I think we've had a tremendous renaissance of network research now that uh, essentially it's an open forum for universities to participate. So uh, I think that's phenomenal as a source of ideas in terms of the university's role. I think another role that the industrial organizations and the industrial research labs of their day play, Bell Labs, Xerox Park, is they were such a significant concentration of, of experts in an area that essentially everybody else had to go visit them, which meant that they became the meeting points and the points at which ideas were exchanged, um, albeit very centralized. I think that we now have a, a essentially, again, with our research system, the universities, uh, universities have now become very public. I'm a networking person, so I think of it in networking terms, packet switches for ideas. And, and, and I think this has actually become now an, an immensely important role for the universities, not just to source the ideas, but to be the, the place where ideas, regardless of where they were sourced, are actively exchanged amongst participants so they can flow to the best place. Uh, thank you, David. Can I add something? To You're that? going to be next, one? Beth, so you yeah. may add something and then. Yeah, I, I, one of the things that arises from this transformation of interactions uh, between the universities and, and the industry research enterprise is that intellectual property becomes a very complicated and interesting subject. <laughs> and, um, and, it, and it deals with two cultures that are coming from very different missions and, and melding those two cultures at the interface of the agreements are, is, a real, is a real challenge that I think I can say without any objection from anybody from the industry side has been handled a little bit bumpily on the side of the universities for a while because they, they saw a few huge blockbuster uh, income producing usually pharmaceutical uh, intellectual property patents make a whole lot of money for a few universities and and it created a, a, a mentality that that a tech transfer office was supposed to be generating income for the university and I think it's taken a while for people to get it that that that, that doesn't really apply at all in fact relatively few tech transfer offices even pay their own expenses in universities around the country in reality, we, we, we envision the tech transfer operation or the intellectual property management to be a mechanism for making sure we maximize the impact of our research enterprise um, in the real world. And so that means that we've had to look, we, we've had to change our mindset from the early pharmaceutical model of how you would do exclusive licensing kinds of approaches to consider a lot more sector specifics. Uh, examples and Citrus is a, is a very good example of a place where a focus on open collaboration has made it one of these switch packets uh, for interaction in a demilitarized zone for industry and university researchers to share. And I think there's been a, a lot of effort in the Bay Area, the Bay Area Science and Infrastructure, Science and Innovation Consortium, BASIC, has had a subgroup. Uh, that's been working on intellectual property issues to try to get some lubrication into this in, this interaction. Uh, and there are a number of people here, actually, I, I noticed from the, the basic group. And uh, that includes HP and Intel and a number of other high-tech, IBM, high-tech groups in the area. Uh, there, there are indeed people and in, in leadership from the research side of the universities who've been sitting down talking about how do we facilitate pathways through this so that we really maximize the ability of this this interface uh, between the in, the research enterprise at the industry uh, side and the basic researchers and the scientists and engineers at the universities and I I think there's really a lot of positive steps being made thank you Beth um, Shankar talk to us a little bit about your vision for, you're the major domo of Citrus, your vision for it, and what do you think the unique opportunities are for Citrus being situated here in California and on the edge of the Pacific? Uh, what are the ripple effects that you'd like to see uh, radiate out from this venture? Uh, let, let me sort of uh, give you sort of from the faculty side sort of three, three drivers. I think the aspirations of the faculty have grown in just the last five or 10 years. As a result, faculty want to take on bigger and bigger projects. 
and I think the multidisciplinarity that you're seeing on campuses is very much an adjunct of the fact that faculty want to take on bigger and bigger projects which cross boundaries. So we use the term multidisciplinarity to celebrate both disciplinary excellence and the fact that a lot of the opportunities are on the boundaries. So that's one trend. The second trend is <clears throat> a lot of our faculty and students and researchers and scientists, I should say in deference to our <laughs> chancellor, <laughs> have realized that this model of sort of just developing something cool and just throwing it over the wall and expecting that society will change simply wasn't working. So I think there's a great desire to not just develop the technologies, not just do the technology push and the science push, but to also make sure that you f find a way to get stakeholders, frequently societal stakeholders, to take notice of the potential of this technology and to then baby it in through uh, adoption. The third trend is what Beth just talked about, which is a culture in which ownership of intellectual property is one which is designed to maximize the impact of the research. I think a philosophy, even though Citrus is new, it's five years old, I think the experience here at Berkeley over the last 30 years, I came here as a graduate student, so at least since 1977, has been one in which it's been Unix, it's been uh, internet protocols, IP protocols, it's been RISC, it's been BSD, and all of those have been based on the principle that in order to be pre-competitive, it's been important, in order to stay ahead of industry, in order to not trip over the feet of researchers and industrial labs, it's important to have adopted a policy of by and large sharing intellectual property with all of our friends in industry and then benefiting from the startups and the success of the companies around us. If you put all of these three together, this is sort of the heritage. And I think Citrus really put, tries to put together the fact that societal interests come first. It's societal scale systems. Those are the ones that we need in transportation, in healthcare, in energy, in the environment, in education, and really the kinds of technology that we need are adjunct for serving those societal goals. And even though we began first with really California's problems, we very quickly realized that California's problems are the nation's problems, and indeed internationally. And I'm very pleased to say that we have now very substantial international relationships with Finland, Denmark, uh, Japan, Taiwan, and, uh, and India. So I think the, the model, the, my aspirations for Citrus are that uh, really that we work on the most compelling problems with the best technologies that we have of the day. And that we, the impact is in the form of better trained students, of course, but also to keep this technology pipeline full. The Bell Labs, the IBMs, the IBM Research Labs, and all the other research labs, they created this technology pipeline so that even when you were commercializing today's technology, there was five years more of good ideas in the, in the back waiting to burst forth. And that would be my aspirations for Citrus. Thank you very much. Now, before we throw it open to questions from you all, uh, let me just uh, probe a little bit amongst the four of you. It seems to me what's really striking about this venture are the, are the last two words in its title, in the public interest, uh, in the interest of society. Uh, what's the rest of the landscape uh, in universities look like in terms of research that's so directly consecrated to sort of breaking through that blood-brain barrier, which often does keep universities somewhat uh, isolated in their knowledge uh, from actually becoming incarnate in practice and in having a societal effect? Who would like to offer some thoughts on that? I'll, I'll start and then hand off. To, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think as someone who really began my career frankly interested only in really quite fundamental issues uh, uh, in, in, in science, uh, not just because I've evolved in an administrative career, but also the world I live in. I think there has been a very significant evolution uh, in uh, people in the university sector, presumably also in the industrial sector, uh, wanting to find ways of connecting the, whatever basic research they do to society as a whole. And we, Beth and I, have had a really invigorating experience the last month, uh, which has been an extreme example of, of this and an interesting model for university industrial interaction in the service of society, in which Citrus will play a very important role 
And that, as some of you may know, that uh, British Petroleum has proposed establishing a energy biomass research institute uh, in partnership with the university. Uh, and they've stepped up to the plate at the level of uh, a half a billion dollars. So $50 million a year over the next 10 years. And that's the, that's the beginning <laughs> investment. So that's not the run out. Uh, and they uh, in, invited uh, uh, proposals from a select number of universities, of which we've been one. We are one, and uh, with, led by Beth and by Steve Chu at LBL. And so we've put together a consortium of ourselves, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, the Carnegie Institute at Stanford, and the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, because in Berkeley we have about two acres of land to try out plants. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they have uh, thousands. And, uh, and, and the, the science and technology of this is very, has been very interesting. Intellectual property has been very interesting. But I think just as interesting has been the number of people in the campus, molecular biologists working on ribosomes, who are interested in changing their research areas to address this, you know, basically of solving a global climate change problem and making the U.S. energy self-sufficient. Uh, and just, you know, have been waiting for us to bring together the set of people, the set of talents. Uh, so this has really been an interesting uh, life experience, which has happened in, you know, at, normally often we universities get accused of proceeding at a glacial pace. This from start to finish has taken about two months to put together this uh, uh, research, multi-institutional research uh, collaboration with a, uh, uh, with a, with a, a uh, um, you know, very, very sophisticated science and engineering uh, and business uh, uh, plan. And frankly, even if this, if it turns out British Petroleum makes some other choice, uh, we uh, certainly, and I'm sure this is going to be a very important part of Citrus endeavors as well, are going to move forward on this uh, one way or another. Frankly, last year, the top five oil companies had profits of $169 billion. So they have a little bit of flexibility. <laughs> I mean, one could ask also, where better to do a venture like this than a public university? Absolutely. After all, we are consecrated to the public interest. Beth, did you, or, or, or David, do you? Well, I, I think your question was how the university landscape was. And I, I think that uh, you, you just hit it, that public universities, and I think the UC system amongst kind of all the public universities in this country, at least, is are, are really the the folks that will make the effort to focus on societal goals. I, I don't think this necessarily does apply to every university, um, and I, I think something that I've always noticed in my interaction with UC is I actually believe that faculty self-select and students self-select. They they choose departments and departments choose them, and that within the UC system that effectively, on average, you will see a more, much higher societal interest than perhaps in other universities where you might see a higher pure science interest or pure engineering interest or industry interest, et cetera. You know, I'm just talking about sort of where the, where the mean is mm -hmm. and there's a distribution around that. And in the UC system as a whole, I think it's very tilted towards these societal interests and, and they're just absolutely crucial to us now. We're realizing these all are, all are multidisciplinary. If we look across the gamut, whether it's, it's energy, whether it's the public infrastructure that we need to desperately to get more efficiency out of and make more intelligent and make work for us, um, our health system, any of these societal goals are, need to be, both be multidisciplinary, but I think require folks that have self-selected with that as a priority for them in their careers. And so from that point of view, I really think the UC system has something unique to offer here. Uh, and I think Citrus has been first to the table um, in, in a leadership role. Um, I think this is really going to be important. I'm sorry to take a little more time okay. because in the United States, if we look at our demographics at a national level, we have a limited amount of human capital to, imply to, to apply to important problems. And essentially, students, you know, we're, we're not going to actually sit down and have a sort of you know, rational discussion of, okay, which, which problems are we going to work on? It's going to be done on a sort of more chaotic economic basis. People will vote with their feet. And the people that are going to be most important are going to be the students, I think, of these great public universities mm -hmm. who I hope will vote with their feet to take on these societal challenges. So in a sense, then, Citrus is a re-consecration 
of this university and the University of California towards this public goal, which uh, has changed, I think, in some significant when, ways. When Richard came to me with, with, with the notion of citrus, you know, it just immediately rang true. This is exactly the right thing for Berkeley and UC. Beth, did you have a thought? I, I was just going to say, during the preparation of the last couple of months of this proposal for the, bio, it's for the Energy Biosciences Institute is what it would be, so it's a focus on feedstocks to fuel. Um, it was really inspiring and exciting to see our very best scientists from all the, the there, there are a whole lot of possible disciplines involved in that long pathway, and, and scientists that have been doing really basic, very, very basic structural biology, for example, many scientists, lots and lots of scientists leapt to the opportunity to apply their really specialized expertise and their state-of-the-art knowledge to trying to solve this 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 problem that really moves people. So I I think I was really very impressed with how broad the the responsiveness to a societal level challenge like how biofuels can we really do something? Can we really make them work in a way that's going to be helpful? Uh, it was really quite inspiring to see. Shankar, let, let me ask you, do, do you, just in a somewhat personal sense, do you find that your conception of your career, your role as a professor, your role as a director has changed? And do you think there is a trend afoot, not just here, but throughout society in this direction? How do you analyze uh, this tendency which we've been describing? Um, I, I, I think that the lives of a lot of our faculty have changed from thinking more broadly, th thinking, um, thinking big about problems. And I think what that does, I think, is to make for much richer kinds of problems to work on. The even disciplinary work becomes considerably deeper. The kinds of questions that one comes up, comes up with are pr pretty deep. Just in thinking about the security of critical infrastructures coming to myself, thinking about the security of critical infrastructures after 9-11, we realized that one really needed to think about how one puts technology into our infrastructures to make them safe. And then, of course, there has been this public debate about security versus privacy. One thing that we realized during the course of the work in working with our colleagues in the law school, our colleagues in the information school, and also with the industrial labs, the Intel Lablet that uh, David helped, helped establish on the edge of campus, was that it's not an either or between security and privacy, that technologies that enhance strong privacy also enhance security, which was very much counter to a message that was being given in a lot of the, the media. So this is, this is an example of one kind of thing that came from thinking about uh, societal problems. Another example is, I, I won't take uh, Eric Brewer's thunder, he's the last speaker, but, and I'd just like to say that Rich Newton and uh, Tom Khalil really set out to show that there was an economic case to be made for the use of technologies in the developing world. And they call that project ICT4B, which is now called TIER, Information Communication Technologies for the 4 billion people. You said Dick Blum said 3 billion, so 3, 4 billion, depending on where you draw the threshold, <laughs> of people making less than uh, this $2 per day. And really, there the it led to some exemplary challenges for wireless infrastructures, low-cost telephone devices. And I must say, as a result of this, out at Citrus, we're saying the future is not a $100 laptop, it's a $30 cell phone. And really, that's an example of the kinds of places where it'll make a big difference. And again, the delivery of healthcare in Africa, in India, in Western China, are all things that get opened up, telemedicine, for instance. Does anybody want to just quickly reflect a little upon the economic sort of catalytic effects of something like this? Uh, Dick Blum mentioned not only the university, the, the area, the state, the nation, and indeed the world. Uh, I mean, this is uh, a generator of, uh, of new businesses, new economies. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think this goes to what Beth said, which is this is precisely why you know, it's really not about can the university make a few more bucks on a licensing deal. Um, it's can the state of California generate, you know, a phenomenal number of new jobs. Uh, as a nation, do we do a better job of taking care of our people overall? Uh, and can we provide a better quality of life uh, to people in other countries? And, you know, the, the, 
uh, I think repeatedly we've seen that the, the key issue, I think, is uh, fr from an economic perspective at a micro level is what business are you in? And I think where we've made a lot of progress jointly uh, in our discussions uh, is the university getting really clear on what business it was in, which, as you said, we want our work to have impact. Mm -hmm. And at the industry level, kind of the companies waking up and realizing they better add their value downstream of the universities, the idea that they're going to sort of appropriate by exclusive license the university technology and make their, their pile out of that just doesn't make sense. They've mm -hmm. got to add their value downstream themselves. And that's, I realize, a more micro view of the economics than, than you were looking for, perhaps. But I, th I think that that also will cause more innovation in industry. Everybody gets the start. Everybody has these, uh, these early insights. And we can all compete uh, aggressively uh, to add value to them. And, and what will happen is we'll add value in many different ways. One final short question to you all. Uh, there are examples where universities make uh, discoveries. And then instead of them becoming privately owned, they're publicly owned. And there's some examples that have come out of Berkeley. Any, uh, maybe you, Shankar, would be a good one to address this. Uh, do you imagine this would be part of the calling of Citrus? Uh, I, I think that uh, the, the, the things that will come out of Citrus, you know, some of them will really be a whole ton of startups, and there have already been a ton of startups. There's been a lot of, uh, there's been a, a lot of in industry sectors almost that have been created by the technologies that go into it. But I, I feel that the legacy of Citrus will really be this mindset about thinking about uh, the, the bigger problems that we face and then sort of compiling that down, to use uh, computer verbiage, down to a set of technological, social, economic issues, and then finally delivering the services that are required to meet societal challenges. Mm -hmm. David, thought? I'm sorry to jump in again, but Please. as I listen to Shankar, what I realized is, you know, I'm actually an immigrant, and one of the things I've really learned to respect about the U.S. is the way people will take ideas and figure out how to make money out of them. That's what the U.S. industry does. I mean, in a phenomenal way that, you know, uh, to be honest, you know, my, my graduate training was in England, and we just didn't get trained to even think like that. And the, where I'm going with this is that, you know, let's look at an, at an area like public infrastructure. Right now, to be honest, Silicon Valley, VCs, that's the most boring thing they could imagine investing in. But go create some innovation in that space, and I bet we can drive a ton of investment and job creation and everything else in those spaces. So in some sense, it's by taking on these challenges, I'm willing to bet that that uh, American ingenuity and innovation and figuring out how to make a buck out of it will follow where you lead. Mm -hmm. And what we'll do is shift the emphasis of where the industry investment ends up. Good. Uh, Bob? Actually, David's uh, opening comment, I think, is also a relevant one. I also happen to be an immigrant. And Shanker, I don't know if you're an immigrant, yes, but Shanker's also an immigrant, so... I grew up, I was born in Texas. And that makes her all... <laughs> <laughs> you're definitely an immigrant. <laughs> I'm an immigrant, too. Especially around these parts. Right. And, and uh, I remember in the past serving on a committee at Los Alamos looking at some complicated issues uh, important for defense, and we realized that of the 13 people giving Los Alamos uh, advice uh, that... Uh, uh, five were born in the United States out of the 13, and this was advice that was fundamental to the security of our nation. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I think the, a very important part of California and California universities, uh, because it's a place which has been characterized by the willingness to take chances and, and, uh, uh, and, and a state that's committed to innovation, is the ability of California to attract from around the world the very best talent. Uh, and we've seen a lot of challenges to that, begun with 9-11, and, and uh, possibly some increase in conservatism. Uh, and I think we, you know, if, if California is going to continue to lead the country and the world, we're going to have to see an evolution in that, and an increased welcoming to people from around the world, and, and uh, both within the state and at, at the federal level as well. Good. All right. Let's uh, uh, throw it open to the floor uh, to questions from uh, you all. Uh, there's some microphones, so uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand or a thought, comment, um, uh, any of the above. Who would like to write here? Hi. Uh, Dan Pitt. <clears throat> I've got a couple of related questions for you, uh, touching on what you mentioned. One has to do with how you would actually fund this research, which we all agree is of great benefit to society. 
Um, and the second is how you actually measure its success. You know, when Bell Labs was funding research, it came off the top because it was a regulated industry, and they were permitted by the regulators to invest a certain amount. The major companies have done it in different ways. We've seen IBM Research and, and HP Labs take the money and fund their own research labs still, and to varying degrees of uh, applied or pure. Um, companies like Microsoft fund a lot of scientists in universities. Companies like Google hire these same people instead of funding them. Um, <laughs> maybe the same individuals in particular. Uh, and yet we know there are benefits to society as a whole, to the companies and to individuals. Um, and how do we motivate you know, the private parties, the companies, and the government to fund the research properly? And how do we actually measure that success, whether it's companies started, as Shankar mentioned, or the number of licenses, or patents, or some societal measures that we then have to correlate to the investment. I'd appreciate your thoughts on those. We'd like to try that one. Shankar, by default. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this question of metrics is, of course, a, is an excellent question. So I, I think that the, the metrics that we, have, we use, so, so our first job uh, is a little bit of this caricature. You know, you say, you, uh, faculty go to industry and they said, they go and peddle their research and then they come back and they say, oh, they don't love us for our research, they love us for our students. So I, I think to first order, really, one of the biggest things, the metrics is a, a, a different cadre of students, especially, you know, undergraduates, you know, we have a, we have an undergraduate experience, and industry is caring for, it really wants people with a capstone experience, where they think about issues beyond the, just the tech push. So I think one important goal is if you are producing the kinds of students that our friends in industry and uh, in government and other places say are a richer set and who are more likely to be leaders than we currently are, that would be one measure. The second measure is more traditional. I think the number of startups, the number of companies that take, uh, that buy these startups, which buy the, which uh, hire the students that uh, we produce and so on and so forth, that's a, the second measure. The third measure I feel is uh, a, 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 almost by way of audit. You know, we found that what has changed from trying to uh, get people to engage in Citrus is that the number of large projects on campus, so a large project is something which is beyond five to eight faculty, sort of, it's more than two faculty, it's sort of five faculty frequently in different areas, a group of 50 graduate students, a loose coalition that holds together for four or five years. And having more of these, and actually being able to count and audit these is another measure. As far as how you fund this, I think that uh, certainly the rising about the gathering storm makes a strong case for the fact that even with a lot of industry support, by and large, I think the major share for the funding of these groups really does need to be on the, on the federal dime. And thus far, it's certainly been the case in Citrus that a lot of the funding has been federal. And of course, that's under threat unless ACI, the American Competitiveness Initiative, passes and so on and so forth, or gets out of continuing resolution, as the case may be. Bob? Uh, that was extremely well said. I want to just add a couple comments in my uh, previous life when I was at MIT, I was involved in arranging a number of uh, collaborations with the industry in, in uh, largely in pharma pharmaceutical and life science area uh, and uh, biotech companies. Uh, and each industry actually had very, turned out when you got into the negotiations actually had very different goals. And I won't name them uh, purposefully, <laughs> but for one, and e each one was funding research at the level of s several million dollars a year on a multi-year basis. Uh, and and, and, and in one company, they really wanted to fund people because they needed more undergraduates and graduate students educated in their area of research, and so, so uh, their area of research and development, so that they would have a, a, a stream of future employees, and that was very successful for them. Uh, another company, it was entirely research, and there was a certain area of basic, uh, basic uh, biological research they wanted investigated, but they did not want to make the investment in hiring their own employees. Uh, because, and, and which it turned out university, MIT in this case, was already doing. And, and that actually lasted for a long time. It turned out to be a very good investment on their part. So I think there's no single model. The, the newest model that, that, that we have uh, with uh, British Petroleum 
and I'm not sure it's a first. I mean, we have the Intel Lablet as a micro example, but I think it's a really interesting uh, model on their part of putting up funds at the level of $50 million a year and creating a new energy research institute, which will have some part proprietary, but most of the work uh, uh, not directed basic research, not undirected, but directed. For British Petroleum, the metrics are going to be very <laughs> straightforward because for British Petroleum, basically, you know, we're going to have to, through our research, develop, first of all, find the ideal plant, switchgrass or miscanthus or who knows what. We're going to have to find, well, my, my phrase is we have to design in the laboratories artificial termites. <laughs> that, that, that we're going to have to find the genetically programmed microbes that are going to convert this plant matter, whatever it is, uh, into, into sugars probably, and then sugars efficiently into alcohols. It's a 10-year program if after 10 years we haven't, you know, the laboratory hasn't produced a cost-effective way of going from, from uh, uh, plants that can be grown with a very low energy cost uh, to a fuel, then it will not have succeeded. So that, that uh, kind of program has very well-defined defined metrics. Next. Questions, thoughts? Right here. Hi, my name is uh, Rajendra Bose, and um, I recently finished an interdisciplinary graduate program in the UC system, and I'm very satisfied with that. But um, I've noticed that there still, still are challenges in terms of um, that the hiring process is still based on disciplinary um, publications and so forth. And I've noticed that that can serve as a barrier. For example, in my experience, computer scientists working with others, um, it's very hard to publish and, and go to the conferences and so forth. So I wondered if you had any comments about how um, the university system or the community can address um, some of these challenges. I'll, I'll start with it and then hand it off. Uh, uh, I, I just happened to come from a lunch where, <coughs> with some random faculty where that subject was the complete conversation of the, of, 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 of the lunch and I got to hear from the faculty about their frustrations within Berkeley from the educational point of view for educational interdisciplinary programs, undergraduate and graduate. And I have to admit, this is not a problem we've solved yet, That's in right. fact. So I'm not going to give you a glib answer saying, oh yes, we'll do X, Y, and Z. Uh, but it's a problem which we're f the faculty and the administration are fully conscious of. And, we, we, and Citrus is one of an example of a kind of, of, of center w which is designed to do that for us. But it is true that people's careers tend initially for young people, relevant to you, has a very, we still have a disciplinary stovepipe model for people in their early careers and, and we have to break that down. We have to find a way of solving that over the next several years. And this is an example where a great public university like Berkeley has to lead the way. I think there's, right, so. Not much to add to that. I think that one's right now. Uh, all I'll say is that industry will really value it. So if you can't make it work at academia, <laughs> get into, get, no, seriously, get into an industry lab, knock one out of the ballpark, and they'll be happy to bring you back with him. <laughs> I think the whole world is suffering a little from this. I mean, we have old categories, and we have a new world. And the challenge is to redefine the categories in which activities take place. And we universities are are struggling with that like everybody else. Okay, questions, uh, right here. Uh, hang on and we'll get you the microphone. One of the big challenges for people in the developing world is they don't have very good facility with reading and writing. You're trying to find something on the internet, you Google it, you get 500,000 hits. You and I can scroll through and we can figure out which ones are important, not too hard because we can read fast, we can skim. Any, are you planning on looking at filtering information so you can take these huge number of hits and instead get them just a few that are maybe a little more relevant? I, am I taking this? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think so. <laughs> so again, I don't want to detract from what <laughs> you're going to hear Eric Brewer a little later this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, all these questions come up. I said future a $30 cell phone. And of course, uh, a lot of people may not even know how to read and write. So questions of voice recognition and then playing back things, uh, having voice synthesis. Uh, there is, of course, Google on the go, which you might have heard of as a way of uh, you know, s sorting data and delivering it to devices. So I think that the, uh, the, bits, the bits and pieces, the technological bits and pieces are there. 
On the other hand, to, to really go back and make sure that they're useful for rice farmers who want to know how much, uh, you know, how much rice costs without going through a middleman and so on. I think this, these will need some interaction with the user and uh, sort of these human computer interfaces that go into it are pretty non-trivial. But I think that there is, there is stuff that's going on which is actually, uh, which is absolutely uh, um, responsive to this. A group of students at Santa Cruz started a project called uh, uh, Urban Garden. And their goal is to tell poor people in Mexico City uh, how to find nutritious enough foods. And that's an example of the kind of project where they query, uh, saying, how can I get a balanced meal? And they give you low-cost alternatives for getting a balanced meal. So there are multiple such efforts that are, uh, that are going on. And they're, they're uh, the non-trivial. And certainly the Blum Center is another exemplar of what's going to address these issues head on. A uh, question right here. Thank you very much. I'm kind of thinking in all this wonderful conversation, back in the early 1960s, there was a leadership in President Kennedy that said, we're going to be on the moon by the end of the decade. And that seemed to create an exciting decade where research, scientific, university, industry all worked in this tremendous thrust to get there. Where do you see uh, this type of leadership emerging in addressing these issues? And how can Citrus and the university and the rest of us try to get that spark that led to so much good happening so quickly? Well, certainly, I mean, let others add, but certainly just in, in the past, and it got mentioned already uh, with the leadership of Norm Augustine and Chuck Vest, uh, we saw this uh, rising above the gathering storm proposal, which built on a number of others. Uh, one of which I happen to be involved in personally also, uh, which did get a resonance in Washington uh, and which we thought was, we hoped with, oh, and turned up in the President's uh, State of the Union ad address last, uh, last year. And we hoped that that was then going to translate into the budget and indeed in this year's budget if we hadn't ended up in the morass we apparently are in right now, we were going to see very significant increases in funding in, in in, in the defense sciences, uh, in basic sciences, but also actually in, in, in basic research in, in the Defense Department. Uh, whether or not the momentum can carry beyond, you know, November and into, uh, you know, since we apparently are not going to have a budget for next year, uh, into next year, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but um, we don't, we don't, we have the equivalent economically, as everyone knows, of, of the threat that we perceived in the 60s. But it's more diffuse, mm. right? And, and I think, you know, the, I don't know if you've read that report, but it's a brilliant report. And, and I think that panel did as well as it could have in, in you know, for a call to, uh, call to scientific and engineering arms, so to speak. And of course, not to be forgotten are state efforts, which seem in certain ways, for instance, climate change to have more promise than national efforts at this point. Um, any other comments on the panel, Shankar? So, you know, so you're talking about metaphors. So I, I think there's one metaphor is a moonshot. There's a different metaphor, which is attributed to Nike. This is a, there is no finish line. I think that uh, perhaps the, it's not just about getting someplace, because these are really problems that will stay with us. And uh, I think it's really a question of getting our best technologies to continue to engage in them. So healthcare, you know, healthcare is only going to get more and more complicated. So I don't think we can say we're going to, in the next 10 years, we're going to do X. So I, th I think uh, maybe it's a different kind of energy than the 60s, perhaps. David, did you? Well, you know, you referred to the sort of, there is both a spread of resources and the joint work between industry and, and government and academia. You know, I, I think if one looked at the numbers, and I haven't double-checked, so I could be wrong, we'd actually find that, th that the actual resources going into research, particularly in engineering and science today, are enormous compared to the 60s. Um, I, 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 all, you know, I very much believe we, we need a lot more resource, so I'm not saying, you know, that, that that's an argument for less or we have enough. But what I'd say is I think we actually have a governance problem and a self-governance problem that the science and engineering community has not actually done its job of providing the sort of self-leadership. Here are the challenges that we are going to sign up to on behalf of the country uh, and in behalf of the world at large. And, and I think that's a problem. 
Uh, I think um, we, you know, in some sense, you know, shouldn't leave it to the whims of presidents, for God's sakes, to uh, set these <laughs> challenges for us. Uh, so I, I do think we have that. Uh, I know in the, in the uh, computing community we've been trying to address this. Uh, we've recently uh, actually formed the uh, Computing Community Consortium uh, to try to provide some uh, vision leadership within the community. Uh, and that's, that's an early step. But I think we should think of this as a self-governance problem and maybe look a little inward here and say, are we really stepping up and doing our job leadership-wise? Uh, maybe right here. Uh, the microphone is coming. Thank you. Following along that same line, uh, we, we see a lot of agreement on the need for addressing disease throughout the world. But is, does the group see um, any need for looking at the change of the world that we see coming towards us? In particular, the global warming issue affects some countries very significantly more than others and some peoples. Is that, is that a target? Is it a target what's happening to our world down the road some some degree? Well, I certainly think that the, 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 there are very many, many challenges that global warming is, is charging. And I think there are groups that are looking at the socio-economic aspects of it, as well as groups that are trying to tackle. I mean, there are so many problems to tackle in terms of better energy, less CO2 emissions, CO2 sequestration. There, there are a lot of strategies going on about how to tackle that. How, to what degree it's actually being sensitively recognized that certain countries in certain areas are going to be so much more drastically uh, affected? I, I, I'm not so sure. Does, does anybody here know of it? I don't know of any. I, I'm not aware. Well, in Canada, they're looking forward to the reopening of the Northwest Passage. <laughs> right. no, I, I think we do have people like Dan Kamen who... We certainly have people right, working, who, especially who on the socioeconomic issues, issues yeah. very strong. There there's are, a, there's right. quite a few people on this campus that are very much engaged in that. So in our Institute for the Environment, there are people, I mean, that specific issue who, who address that very directly. There are uh, also, I mean, on the health side, there's a number of people who specifically are focusing their research efforts on third world diseases, which yeah, you know, pharmaceutical diseases. companies are not interested in because they don't see any way that they're going to make significant profits. And so that's research that almost certainly has to be done uh, you know, in as under, not as directed basic research in universities. We have time for one more quick question. Yes, right behind the camera. Uh, Uh, the director said um, citrus funding is mainly federal funded. So is University of Citrus de um, cultivating friends in Congress or st in state level and uh, national level? Otherwise, how can you get funding? I, I think the, the, the answer is, I think our faculty in Citrus really compete on national programs and uh, I think, I'd like to think we win more than our fair share as, uh, but uh, I, I think the, the friends in Congress are useful more for setting up programs that we can compete against rather than, uh, you know, to specifically favorize. So, and I think some of what uh, David talked about, Tenenhaus talked about a second ago, is sort of signing up to not the 1960s, as Steve Beck said, but 1950s, when one of our Bush had this, the scientists of America had a compact with the country about signing up for better health care, better economic, better economics, better economic well-being, and national, better national security. So I think as an adjunct of that would be. Uh, would be a, uh, a call for greater public funding. And so uh, I would say our contact with Congress is to sort of create the playing field for us. Uh, David. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, both, both Shankar and I have gone and done our national service within government agencies. And, um, you know, it, it's not just about actually, con you know, all Congress can actually do is pork the budget to help you. Uh, What's best is actually if an agency asks for the money and then your congressional delegation is helping to get that approved. 
So you actually have to reach into the agencies, I think, and be very involved in their planning processes. So they're proposing the sorts of programs. It's a lot easier for Congress you know, to win congressional support for something that's being proposed than it is to uh, get Congress to mandate something that the agencies don't want to do. And from that point of view, the real way to do it, I mean, I, I applaud Berkeley for, you know, and Shanker for going, Berkeley for creating the circumstances which you could go, and I'd urge you to let half more of your faculty go do the public service of being involved. Um, and that will be, I think, what actually assures the continued uh, federal support. Uh, just to add to that, I mean, there's no doubt uh, from the parochial Berkeley perspective that we can do government relations better. Uh, and so several months ago, we actually moved government relations, uh, that effort directly into the chancellor's office. So it's one person away from myself uh, and Beth. And uh, we're in the process of expanding our government relations staff really more at the federal than at the state level. And in, we've put together a council of, of, of people on the campus who have particular uh, expertise uh, on state and federal government relations. Uh, the other thing is that uh, both for our campus and for the UC system uh, as a whole, we're, we're in the process of putting together a, uh, a whole set of, of uh, friends, some of whom are in this audience, uh, who can act as advocates on behalf of not just Berkeley, but on behalf of the universities uh, 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 as a whole in terms of both state and federal funding, funding of research. And uh, there are many people, including those in, some in the audience, who have you know, very direct relationships with uh, leading politicians. Of course, Dick Blum happens to be married to Diane Feinstein. That helps. Uh, but, but more than that. And so uh, we can do a certain amount. But actually, we feel that, that our friends and allies in industry are actually probably more important as spokespeople uh, and, and as people who can influence state and federal government than we are ourselves. Well, for Richard Newton, uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking our four panelists. Thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, I think we're going to have a short break. It will be a short break, uh, and you will be uh, let know uh, what time to return. Three o'clock. Three o'clock. Good afternoon and welcome back. After this rousing panel, I'm not sure there's a whole lot to say, but I must say the rest of the session after my talk is going to be uh, uh, really quite worthwhile. Uh, so before I introduce my speakers, I'll uh, let me tell you a little bit about the state of Citrus. So I'm Shankar Shastri. I'm the current director of Citrus. There are many, many friends of Citrus in this room besides those that we acknowledged. And uh, it was great to see Dan Pitt asking a question. I know Dan and Dave, uh, Dave Tenenhaus, have spent so much time getting it. Uh, I want to recognize my predecessor, Rujna Baichi, who was the founding director, and uh, Jim Demmel, who was the you know, the first chief scientist. So a lot of them did the heavy lifting and I only sort of came in uh, after it was all going. Uh, so this is, uh, it's, it's a partnership with four campuses. It's Davis, Berkeley, Merced, and Santa Cruz. And uh, this sort of planetary representation is geographically accurate anyhow in terms of where they are in the state of California. <clears throat> 
our job, as we decided on the panel, was to keep this technology pipeline full, to get a savvy workforce. And the other parts are that concomitant with this, uh, which what Dave called the desire in America to make money, is creating jobs through harvesting the best economies. And the last part is really to create this ecosystem. You know, the ecosystem that we talked about at Bell Labs and IBM and so on and so forth, it's an ecosystem which is truly international in addition to, uh, so it has governmental stakeholders, in venture, industry, uh, academia, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of our mission statement. And from the beginning, we've really sort of thought about societal problems first. And these are the set of societal problems that we've always focused on. Energy, education, transportation, IT for emerging regions, which you'll hear about in Eric's talk, the environment, both monitoring as well as being more activist about it, emergency response, uh, homeland security, that's the, uh, it's perhaps another way of thinking about it, and finally, healthcare. This is information and communication technologies for the better delivery of healthcare and service sciences. I'll tell you a little bit more about these two during this talk. So, it's been a, just a really wonderful partnership between these four UC campuses. As Dick Blum said, it's uh, one university, ten campuses. So this is our Northern California four campuses. It's, um, um, and these are, the, these are what the Citrus-affiliated buildings look like. The Merced Building, which is actually a brand new building, Santa Cruz, uh, Davis, and of course Berkeley, we just had a hole in the ground. So we have a, a picture of the... Uh, I, and I wanted to say that there was significant funding from the state of California for doing this, but really a lot of the support has come from, uh, from really from private donors and very substantial gifts and from industry. Uh, just to give you a sense of this, uh, when we started off, we started off with a certain number of founding corporate members. Over time, this has grown a little bit into platinum corporate members and associate corporate members. They're all over the world. These are the, the stars show where they are. And there are 31 of them. Additionally, 60 other companies. So these are rather substantive commitments in terms of the level of support. 60 companies in addition to that. Also, as, you, as I'll describe to you in a second, the operating model of Citrus is to be a, an umbrella for a bunch of different centers. And there are separate industrial sponsorships of those centers. So our job, the way we think about it, is we help initiate these research centers because we feel that that's where the sweet spot is. And the sweet spot is in the form of these groups, five to eight faculty, 50 to 80 graduate students. And in addition, when we've announced them, we almost always announce them and there's been one large federal sponsor of about a million dollars or more. And then two or three corporate sponsors, and then perhaps a few other sponsors thrown into it. And the life of one of these centers, we think, is about uh, five to eight years, even though sometimes the agenda can go on uh, longer than that. So just in the last five years, we've created over 20 of these. And these are the names of some of the centers. And they're all over. There are Berkeley, Santa Cruz, Davis, Merced. There's a Merced Water Initiative. There is a Davis-led optical networking center. And by and large, they have always had this model of large corporate, large federal grant and then lever offered as leverage to our industrial sponsors. Except recently, um, two, ex two examples of how the landscape may be changing. The Chancellor and uh, Beth just uh, uh, alluded to this BP-led initiative, which may be an exemplar of how things are changing where it's really a corporate-led initiative. And my colleague Dave Patterson, has put together an initiative called the Rad Lab, that's all the way at the bottom on the right, where the sense has been that it's really underwritten primarily by industry. Of course, uh, the $169 billion of profits is perhaps uh, a sector of the industry that can sustain this a lot better than the uh, IT uh, industry, even though the IT industry, of course, is doing well. <clears throat> Just to give you a sense of some of the recently announced centers, and I've tried to get some from all the campuses, and they are pretty diverse. A, a lot of them on this slide have to do with energy and the environment. Uh, there's a uh, aerosol health effects center at UC Davis. That's Gauna Schwarzenegger with the Davis Chancellor at the Energy Efficiency Center. It's hydrogen economies. 
Prime is a Berkeley Center which is dedicated to the fact it's really a project in collaborative science. Different people have uh, work on different parts of combustion. Uh, for instance, they're thinking about methane combustion and the idea is they work on different bits and pieces and even though science is supposed to be falsifiable, they have so many different sort of snapshots of this process of methane combustion that uh, there's no real agreement, there's no way to put this all together and prime is a way of trying to do how, trying to figure out how to do collaborative science. You know, we all talk about being deluged by mountains of papers and not being able to compare one against the other and that's sort of the broader agenda. A lot of projects on water and the usage of water starting from the Sierra snowpack to its utilization in, uh, in, in, in California. <clears throat> so the four strategic directions uh, have been energy in the environment and that's joint with the project that the Chancellor talked about, Helios, with, and the, uh, which is headquartered at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, intelligent infrastructures. So as, again, as David said, you know, people think of infrastructures as boring, but really, and I'll say with uh, immigrant zeal too, I think the strength of this nation has been, the strength of California, has been a strong infrastructure on which you can build a robust economy and when the infrastructure sags, you've got to get the best technology into our infrastructures. And once you get the best technologies, I think there's a business case to be made for it. I'll say something about service sciences and technology, but roughly speaking, this is the notion of how high wage regions can still make a uh, can still build intelligent services and make a profit in the face of technology that's being increasingly commoditized. And finally, the last area is the use of information technology for better delivery of healthcare. Now, an exemplar of where I think in the last four or five years we've actually had a lot of success, and it's with uh, partners in industry. There's some pictures here from Intel. This is Intel instrumenting Great Duck Island off the coast of Maine. Uh, but there are lots of pictures here about the fact that these wireless sensor networks, we can basically instrument the world. You know, redwood trees, uh, firefighting, Paul Wright's firefighting, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, factories, uh, outdoor firefighting, Nick Sitar and a whole host of other applications. And these last two applications s refer to the process control industry, the chemical industry, the oil and gas pipelines. The infrastructure for controlling them is already becoming these wireless sensor networks. So last year, the prediction, so this is a technology that really started in 2000, 99, 2000 maybe. But today, analysts estimate of the size of this market is 60 to 80 billion. So last year it was 20 billion, but it, it really, since there has been such a large set of applications, especially in uh, this process control industry, there are several large companies, Honeywell, uh, Emerson, etc., which are all sort of now struggling with the standards required to move forward with this. One other example, which is closer to home, which shows the partnership with the state, is that uh, we worked with PG&E and the California Energy Commission to try to get this technology into homes. So you all know that, in the, and you'll see a lot more of this in Paul Wright's talk, which is to follow. But the notion is that if you can have these wireless sensor networks, you can start instrumenting homes to be able to turn devices on and off or control their consumption in response to pricing signals. The pricing signals are what has been, the pg and &E has put into place and that's a million households in July 2006, whereas the micro moats that we'll use for instrumenting the inside of homes is what, we'll, uh, what is going to come out of this technology. So this is stuff that's not just uh, pie in the sky, it's really stuff that's showing up. Now, let me just, uh, in my remaining few minutes, just tell you a little bit about what we're doing in services and what we're doing in healthcare. So this is a picture, and I'm sure a lot of you see these pictures there in The Economist and, and uh, so on and so forth. They mention, they show the fact that A is the agricultural sector, G is goods, and S is services, even in, <clears throat> even in countries like India, China, Brazil, uh, the, the fraction of the workforce that's moving into services is growing dramatically. Now, we think that we need to try to teach our students about how do you deliver services. You know, if hardware is going to be commoditized and software is going to be written offshore, the question about how do you put together services is an important one. Also, when you think of, take a look at some recent successes, Google, eBay, iPod, these are all examples of the success of services 
on top of commodity technology. So the question is, how can we teach our students, uh, and, and they're all based on the fact that information and communication technologies are really changing the nature of how we deliver services. The question we've set ourselves to ask is how we try to do this. So one of the first things we've done, and this was related to the talk about the educational mission, is we think that there's a sweet spot to try to offer a certificate program, sort of like a master's, in service sciences, management, and engineering. And the kinds of, and here's a little bit about what we're doing in Santa Cruz and Berkeley. Uh, we will probably be doing more at Davis and Merced as well. And the research opportunities that go on with them are in some key service areas. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about what the service problems are in the area of healthcare. To talk about healthcare, you know, we, we all have seen, again, we all are aware of the magnitude of this problem. It's uh, between 15 and 16 percent of our GDP. It's the fastest growing sector of the economy, growing 7 percent. And in, in the industrialized world, the U.S. is the fastest growing, the, the cost of health care is the fastest growing in the industrialized world. Of course, if you believe the 7 percent number, then in a few years, the entire economy will be just health care. So <laughs> you wonder about these uh, sustained growth numbers. On the other hand, what is true also is that uh, the percentage of population over the age of 65 is also growing, and the question is, can you use information and communication technology to better deliver health care? And the answers are that there's a huge amount of new technology that's showing up. So telemedicine, this particular set of pictures is telesurgery. And the next one is that we have really finally got, as of February 2005, uh, legislation that supports personal electronic medical records. And so these are examples of what you can do. So why, why are all these important? So for instance, of this $2 trillion, 30% of it is spent in lab tests. That's $600 billion. Of that, 70% is in moving paperwork around. So that's $400 billion. And we all know that your, your pathology tests are never in the right place. So, and so even though we spend $400 billion, it's because the, 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 paper, the records are simply not moving. If you can own your own electronic medical records and sort of have an ontology, have a tree structure for being able to search through data, you might be able to do a lot better. And that's the sort of technology piece that goes along with this delivery. So here, and we're doing this jointly with uh, Reg Kelly's Institute QB3, which is another one of these, and <clears throat> three, three things that we're doing, sort of this pre-symptomatic sensing uh, of, uh, of, uh, of diseases using low sample sizes, but then use the use of wireless portals for, rather than having a pull model, which is a doctor says you should have such and such a test, especially for chronic conditions, have a push model of continuous monitoring. And finally, you know, even though this may seem like electronic medical records may seem like a, a techie thing where you own your record rather than the hospital, it creates a huge sea change of who has access to what, an audit of these electronic medical records. So the, the, again, the play between security and privacy, high confidence medical devices. If, if there's all these computer chips in, your, in medical devices monitoring yourself and in hospitals, what if a hacker wants to attack them? And you know, how do you sort of guard against this? Uh, those are the kinds of questions that we're looking at. So in conclusion, I would like to say that you know, people use this term public-private partnership, PPP, quite often in a, uh, an almost uh, in throwaway fashion. But I have to say that Citrus really has been this uh, PPP, this public-private partnership, really harnessing the best of private giving, state support, federal support, and we, I really hope that it will be a transition bridge between academia and industry for solving uh, the strongest problem, the, the most uh, pressing problems that society will have. So uh, to see more, we have a website where uh, uh, at the price of trying to negotiate this website, you can, you can, or you can find a lot of information. We're trying to work on making it easier still. So thank you very much for all your support. And uh, I, will, uh, I will segue right away into the second piece of this. So this was a little bit of an overview of Citrus. Uh, what I now want to do is to present two of my colleagues 
who will explain, who will work through the details of two important research items, the uh, two research thrusts. The first one is the chief scientist for Citrus, uh, Paul Wright. And Paul will talk to us about the energy challenge and what we are doing in Citrus on energy. So let me welcome to the stage Paul. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it really is a great pleasure to represent many colleagues in this room. Uh, and energy, well, I do believe, is the most serious challenge that we face going forward in the planet. And in that regard, I use a quote here from a, a Nobel Prize winner, but you only have to pick up your recent Economist or the New York Times or look anywhere in the media and you know that this is a growing concern of everyone. Largely because we face what that popular phrase is of a perfect storm. The perfect storm being this first aspect of supply. Our supplies are reducing. And as shown in this slide, not only are our supplies reducing, but again, we all know in this room, since we read a lot, that many of our oil supplies are in politically unstable parts of the world, and a small change makes a big difference. So, for example, you can hear that I'm also an immigrant, and I have one of those funny English accents. There was a period when the uh, natural gas could be purchased from Russia, but after the Yukos affair, uh, there was a big uh, reduction in that supply, which had a big impact on our energy resources in England, and it then began to push our emission levels up because we had to go back to using oil and coal. So there are very delicate balances in our world society. At the same time, this next slide shows that the demand curve is increasing radically. Over the next 50 years, we expect the demand everywhere to increase, and that's especially underscored by this next slide. Forgive me that it's a bit uh, techy looking, but this is a really interesting slide. It's really worth looking at the axes on this curve. Along the bottom of the curve, it basically shows you how much energy we use per capita in different countries. The US and Canada are on the top right, and the European countries are in the middle. Don't feel badly about your Canadian friends like the Chancellor. It often means that there's a very large uh, industry like aluminum smelting that uses very large amounts of energy. But nevertheless, you can also see there's large numbers of countries on the left-hand side of this curve that really need to be brought up in their standards of living. And this curve, from our colleagues at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, uh, shows that the dotted line is about the kind of threshold mark from where you move from a, a challenged society to a more uh, wealthy one, where health care and education and hospitals are better. So when you start to use about 4,000 kilowatt hours per annum of electricity, that's a kind of a threshold mark of a, of a safe society with water and energy and so forth. So you can see from a supply point of view that all of the countries towards the left-hand side of this curve are going to want to move up. And then, understandably, as we increase the demand and increase use, we then begin to impact on this other aspect of the perfect storm, the global warming and the emissions is issue. And that's one of the things that we all say differentiates this energy crisis from the one that was the uh, Arab oil embargo in 1973. Then we really focused on energy uh, increases, but we weren't quite so concerned at that time about the impact on global warming. So any solution that we come forward with has got to mitigate levels of carbon emissions in order to provide balance in the, in the universe. So that's where this perfect storm comes from. The supply, the demand, the political insecurity, and the impact on the environment. So that's a key element of how I want to structure the, the, the remarks that I'm going to make. How we're going to do that is to focus on two key strategies, one of which is to do with efficiency and much more conservation in the civilized countries that really use a lot of energy. The other areas, these two through five, are renewable and carbon-free environments <laughs> that will allow us to increase our supply whilst not impacting the environment. Now, next to this, on the right-hand side, is an interesting curve. If we carry on with what people call business as usual, 
business as usual, our carbon emissions will follow this top curve. And as we go to 295 throughout this century, that will have some dramatic impact on the environment, which is not the topic of my talk today, but most people in this room know what that means. The ideal case then is to create these new environments and follow this lower curve where the emissions to the atmosphere are reduced. So the rest of my talk is about providing these solutions on the left in order to achieve these reduced carbon emissions on the right. It's, if colloquially, you could say it's having your cake and eating it too. And so the rest of my talk is going to be about shaving off those various areas. First of all, I'm going to talk about conservation, and then I'm going to follow it with the various shavings off that comes from renewable energy, nuclear energy, coal to gas substitution, and carbon capture. And all through Citrus, it's a great honor for me to realize I have wonderful colleagues that are attacking these different areas. So this broad portfolio of activities will answer this perfect storm problem. Let's now then move to the first topic. I hope I've set the stage now. If you fall asleep, I, don't, I think that's unusual. I got a very strong, uh, loud voice, uh, as my wife keeps telling me. But let's go through those five. But in the unhappy event you do fall asleep, I think you've got the basic idea of the citrus mission in this area. <laughs> so power aware buildings. At the bottom here, too, I've acknowledged one of our founders of energy efficiency on the Berkeley campus, Arthur Rosenfeld, in 1973, with colleagues, uh, was a big uh, influence on Berkeley's strategy in energy and began the efficiency buildings in the uh, Lawrence Berkeley laboratories and on campus. And that all is about making these power aware buildings, meaning that in the crisis we need to face in order to reduce consumption is shown in this curve here. And again, here's another curve, so forgive me for showing you graphs in a, in a sort of a general talk, but this is the way in which we as Californians used energy in around the year 2000 and 2001. Along the bottom axis are the, uh, year, are the, are the months going from January to December. On the y-axis uh, is the peak loads, not your personal load, but the peak load for the day. And not surprisingly, you can see that during the summer months, those hot, sweaty months in the summer, there are these great over demands for air conditioning. Now, that's basically like a traffic jam on the Bay Bridge. Everybody wants to get there at the same time. Everybody wants to use air conditioning at the same time. So we want to reduce that. And how we're doing that in these large citrus projects, working with, I have many colleagues that are working with me on that topic and, and good friends at the California Energy Commission, Ron Hoffman and Arthur and others. What we're doing is building these ad hoc self-organizing networks to create price signals that go into our houses from these wireless infrastructures that will tell you in the middle of the afternoon electricity is much more expensive. This is not a good time to do your washing. This is not a good time to run your pool pump. And if you're really part of this, you want to make your air conditioning a little uh, uncomfortable, a little less comfortable in order that you uh, reduce your usage. And so here is a cartoon of myself and my wife in my kitchen. She's always got um, cold feet. So I put one of these little sensors right next to her to improve my marriage whilst we're doing this uh, technology rollout. And just to give you some idea, I'm going to walk forward at this moment. I have one of these little guys in my pocket. You can see, those of you in the back, you won't see it. But you see here, what I'm basically holding is about the same amount of computer technology that my sort of 1990 IBM would have had, all rolled into a very small device about the size of a quarter. It has a, a computer chip on the front, wireless radio on the back, and a variety of places where you can attach sensors. And so you can see the general idea that my house will become uh, wireless aware, that input signals will come from PG&E and the other uh, IOUs in California, and we will run our house based on that kind of uh, information related to the cost of electricity. And as Shankar just showed in his recent slide, that is beginning to get traction with PG&E, Southern California Energy, and San Diego Gas and Electric. They're already beginning to install these wireless meters, which are shown on the top right. And our job in Citrus is to make these technologies for the wireless meters, wireless thermostats, and wireless infrastructure much more inexpensive, and that's the smaller modes that you see going up into that picture there. The other aspect of fuel efficiency is very much uh, run by my colleagues in mechanical engineering. Here is an example of a tiny motor. 
its objective is to have this miniaturized rotary engine for portable distributed power. And it's very well designed. It has a very small number of parts. A key element you can see in the middle, it can run on a wide variety of fuels. And the interesting thing that comes out in the end, that a tiny motor, not much bigger than a sugar cube, one cubic centimeter, has enough to uh, power a small environment of 33 watts. Well, that's not as strong as this searchlight that's bouncing off my head right now, but it's certainly in the same ballpark as these lights in the ceiling. So you can see that these miniaturized power sources are really being beginning to take play. Shankar mentioned Prime. This is another exciting mechanical engineering project studying combustion. The fascinating aspect still of our combustion environments is that we have a relatively inefficient uh, combustion process in most engines. A lot of the uh, connections between the incoming fuel and oxygen and the, and the ignition is still leaving us with a lot of residual material inside the piston. And my colleagues like Bob Dibble are working on these homogeneous charge compression ignition engines where all of the incoming gasoline or all of the incoming diesel is fired at once and gives you a much more effective engine. Plus, it doesn't lead to uh, uh, nitrous oxide and other emissions that have to be dealt with with your catalytic converter. Another interesting thing, this is just an interesting fact that most of us, are, especially in California, you see more... Um, uh, electric vehicles being uh, driven. There's a difference between a plug-in hybrid and the kind of hybrid which is a Toyota Prius, but even now we have these 50 mile per, allen, per gallon uh, Toyota Priuses, and if we all drove these plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, a substantial uh, reduction would occur in, uh, in American usage of gasoline. Finally, uh, in this particular area of sustainable transit, we all sit, on, everybody in this room sits on the Bay Bridge looking at other people in cars thinking there must be a better solution to this. And my colleagues in the Institute of Transportation Studies, which is based in civil engineering, have had the luxury of completely redesigning a, a transportation system in this area of China. And what they've done in these maps that are laid out here is really made sure your problem on the Bay Bridge is somewhat solved. And I, I realize it is, when I sit there, I realize that if I'm going to a business meeting in San Francisco and I can get off the BART and be right there, well, then I'll take BART. But if I've got to take those subsidiary kind of routes out to North Beach or down to South of Market, the buses never connect. I can never find a taxi. It's pouring with rain, and I'm really frustrated. And so next time, I take my car. So what is really needed in these things is to have an efficient connection between the, the BART system in, 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 the Bay, in the Bay Area and these distributed buses that would, for sure you would know when you got to a BART station in San Francisco that a bus would pick you up or a taxi would pick you up and take you where you want to go. So this, is, this project is all about moving people around in the right way. So that was my first slice. I missed off many other wonderful colleagues that I could have talked about. Jim Evans may have come into the room. He's working on energy efficiency in aluminum smelter. Van Kerry may have come into the room somewhere. He's working with Hewlett Packard on energy efficiency in these big data sensors. And you know, Google has just moved its uh, big server farms up to Oregon to take uh, use of the hydroelectric power up there. But Van and his colleagues are trying to do the best they can with minimizing energy use in these big servers at HP in the Bay Area. So there's a very large number of colleagues working on reducing the use. And that was my green slice. Okay, I take a breath and I go on now to alternative fuels, which you heard a little, about, a little bit about today in the context of these wonderful colleagues at British Petroleum who are interested in starting a, a large center somewhere in the international community to address uh, renewable fuels. This is the key uh, slide that our Helios colleagues use. And what's key about this slide, there's a lot of arrows on this, but just try and focus in this short talk on the three, way, three ways here of producing energy from the sun. Obviously, um, and Arnold has just announced the million uh, solar homes, uh, obviously one key, key element is to get uh, more solar power, and that's the bottom line, the electricity. And then across the top here is the possibility of growing these plants that you heard the Chancellor mention through this cellulosic route in order to produce, produce these wide variety of fuels which are interchangeable. So let me just talk about these couple of routes in this renewable area for a while. Uh, Willie Nelson and many other famous uh, 
people have promoted the uh, biodiesel and biocorn, and that has been going from these monocultures for some time now, and about 3% of U.S. auto fuels are using uh, ethanol from corn. The small problem with that is that the fossil fuels are still used for the fermentation. So colleagues in civil engineering like Tad Pasek and, and, uh, and others that are in, in the room right now have really tried to understand the full energy use of those uh, kinds of ways of producing ethanol. And so what's been going on in more recent years is that the cellulosic sources, which are like switchgrass or poplar, are a little bit more effective in reducing greenhouse gases in the environment because during the growth of those plants, they're woody kind of plants and they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So when you do the full energy balance, these kind of cellulosic sources for doing this kind of uh, energy production are on balance a little better. And actually, if you're a subscriber of Science Magazine, just this week on the front page are these prairie grasses which can be grown in a non-monoculture way in order to produce these kind of environments and it seems like the results from these uh, prairie grasses are also very effective in this in this environment. Let me give you a snapshot too on microbial fuels which uh, Beth and others are working on. And, and you know I have to say as, a, as a, a scientist in this area I feel really honored to be part of Citrus and it's here where I'd like to take my hat off to Richard and others and, and Dado, the Banatel family, Dado for, for starting Citrus with your vision because some of these, I mean, these things are genuinely exciting, so exciting when I talk about this to my family or to people on an airplane, it seems like magic. Okay, so you're looking at this slide and there's this boring little piece of green algae in the middle, this Brachiococcus brown eye algae. Do you realize that that little sucker can actually produce biodiesel? In its own DNA, it, it produces with sunlight and CO2, it makes a very, very slow dribble of C15, C18 dribble. But it does it so slowly that it would take you weeks to make an egg cup full of the thing. Now moving along though, coming to this other, uh, this other bacteria, this one here mentioning Chlamydomonas, that can replicate itself very, very quickly. So here's the key thing. This is an exact perfect example of uh, genetic manipulation where if you combine the DNA in the correct way, there's the possibility that the, uh, the first algae that I showed combined with the second algae, one of which can produce diesel, other of which that grows very quickly in the sunlight and with CO2, will produce these materials very, very quickly. And that's the key element of some of these new environments that we're, we're looking forward to. So Jay Kiesling and many of our colleagues in bioengineering have been doing the same thing for uh, the, the degradation of ligniocellulosic material that I mentioned before. So instead of doing it with lignin or worse still with fossil fuels, we have the opportunity of taking these woody products and using these different ways to produce ethanol and these other mixtures of interesting hydrocarbons. And the idea of the algae and working with the uh, genomes of the structure is fascinating. We have many companies uh, involved in that. Uh, the Genome Research Institute is in Walnut Creek who are studying the way in which the uh, genome of those algae are described. That hasn't been fully worked out yet. And so those are the exciting things that the Chancellor and Beth mentioned before that are being centrally addressed in these projects going forward. The other aspects of alternative power are thermoelectrics. Uh, we are using these thermoelectrics to power many of the wireless sensor networks that you mentioned before. In the uh, aluminum smelting, for example, the smelters are very hot and you can power the electronics from a thermoelectric effect shown on the right. Here are some of the examples that colleagues like Arun Majumda have made. And he and are working on improving the Carnot efficiency, really basically the output from these thermoelectrics. And there are the, uh, the best materials at the moment are like these exotic bismuth telluride uh, materials which are very expensive and over time we're trying to get the same kind of efficiencies with much cheaper inorganic materials. Coming now to the alternative power from sunlights, um, Paul Alavasatos, another one of our close colleagues, um, has been working on increasing the efficiency of solar cells. I chose an example here of a plastic film solar cell for him, which is really being um, giving very good efficiency because it's impregnated with these very small ca cadmium selenium uh, nanorods, selenium nanorods. So why is nanotechnology so important? For those of you that maybe don't, uh, you, you see the word nanotechnology and you think, okay, it's very small, so what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. When sunlight comes in 
through the top of this, through the indium tin oxide, which is a transparent material on top of the PV source, the, fo the, um, exit the excitons in this region, what's happening is that electrons are being bashed out from the valence band into the conduction band, and temporarily these excitons, which are positive, and, uh, positive holes and negative charges, are temporarily available to deposit onto the, cab onto the nanorods. Now, what's interesting, if that doesn't happen very quickly, then they just, the Coulomb forces just bring them back together again. So in this next slide, here's the, ex the exciting thing. You see what Paul and his colleagues have done, is that on the cadmium selenium nanorods, they've put these dots. What that does is increase the, the area. So the nanoparticles create much more surface area, so that when the um, excitons are available, as shown in these slides on the left here, they, they can be captured much more quickly because there's more surface area, and this gives much absor more absorption and gives you more effectiveness. So here already, we're seeing that the combination of clever science and clever structures, as is shown here with these nano rods and, and nano dots, as shown uh, on this slide here, gives you much more effective uh, PV efficiency. The most ambitious project that they're working on is shown in this slide, and I'll just try and go a little slower here. On the left side is the way in which most plants do natural photosynthesis. The green blocks have um, the light falling on them. The, photos, the pho photons are falling, those yellow arrows at, at the top there are, are the uh, falling on these parts of the plant to create uh, photosynthesis and then naturally enough in most plants that process slows down once they have enough material and then these other areas of the plant begin to produce the materials that the plant needs to live especially especially water and so what Paul and his colleagues are trying to do is a very exciting project they're trying to build these fabrics where, where you're looking face onto these fabrics and these little hexagons here um, are various structures where they're isolating parts of the material that can mimic the plant's additivity mobility to optimize this photon absorption. And then second parts of the plant are using these cyobacteria materials that create the water. So just like the things that might be going on over here in this natural state, they're trying to provide pockets over here which do the same kind of thing. And then these photoelectrochemical cells at the nano level will be there to create materials. A very advanced idea, and this is what the a key element of the next Helios project is about. We have a wonderful nuclear engineering department coming to this next phase of my talk. And on this couple of slides here, I really want to stress that our colleagues in that department have contributed as much as anybody in the country to the safety and the designs of some of these smaller footprint boiling water reactor nuclear power plants. And the 20% uh, of electricity that's now being used in the U.S. will suddenly st will begin to increase over time. Now that my colleagues in those departments, uh, uh, the, the chairman, uh, Yasmina Vucic, is here right now to take questions over the break. And they have made big advances in this Yucca Mountain repository. Notice that it's only the U.S. and Finland that have decided where their repository sites are going to be. But because of the increased safe safety measures, as you can see in the sort of smaller print here, uh, more nuclear reactors are being designed in the U.S., more are in the queue to be approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Agency, and in future, uh, I'm, pr I'm almost certain that nuclear power is going to be a bigger part of the American uh, landscape as it is in France and other countries that are more related to, um, uh, to nuclear power. Just in my last five minutes, I want to stress, sad but true, um, the coal situation will always make us somewhat dependent on coal in the near-term future, and that's where a lot of science is needed to be done, again by uh, colleagues around citrus. At the moment, the kind of general picture is that in the U.S., it's 50% coal, 20% nuclear, 18% natural gas, and about 7% hydro, but as I said somewhat comically here, unfortunately, coal is still dirt cheap. And if you compare it to these other things like natural gas, fossil fuel composites, and crude oil, it's still the cheapest way to go. And it is alarming that the newer economies like China and India that are so desperate for new energy are still building uh, coal-fired power plants. And there's a lot of international uh, collaboration that we need to take leadership on to make all of us work together to reduce our dependency on coal. So uh, colleagues in mechanical engineering, civil engineering, are working on these various routes. You see this one comes from coal polarization through to electricity. 
but there are these other routes that are shown in the slide that can produce liquid fuels, synthetic chemicals, hydrogen, and so forth. Carbon capture and storage is another thing that's very interesting and is part of many of our colleagues in Citrus. You know, there are new power plants that use coal being built all the time. There are two being built right now in the Ohio River Valley that I know something about since I used to be a professor in Pittsburgh. I know where those sites are, and they have already been designed to be carbon ready for sequestration. And what that means is that uh, in the exhaust docks, um, there is the opportunity to capture the emissions, to mix the carbon uh, emissions with amines, uh, the hydrogen and the oxygen go off into different places, and then there's an opportunity to either liquefy or solidify the carbon emissions. And these projects are also very much part of our civil engineering environment because they have to be safely stored either underground, as shown on the left, or under sea, as shown on the right. And this is a topic that obviously I would talk about with, with uh, more time. So the last couple of slides, as I said, our Citrus solution is to focus this wide range of faculty throughout the four campuses. Merced, uh, Jeff Wright, the Dean of Merced is here today. Merced has done an enormous amount for conservation and energy efficiency in the design of their buildings. I ran through the kind of power aware building stuff. I showed you that cartoon of my wife. I mentioned the work of other folks in the server farms. I showed you the fuel efficiency work on combustion. That example of improving, say, the BART system, so there's a bus there to work with you as soon as you arrive. I went through some of these exciting environments of biofuels and biopower. I stressed the emerging safety of nuclear energy. I stressed the importance of turning coal into other fuels, not just directly by pulverizing it and making it straight into, into electricity. And I stress this opportunity of capturing the carbon at the top of these uh, particular power plants that I mentioned in the Ohio River Valley and storing it. So there's a very wide portfolio of opportunities that are in our citrus work. And we're going to be addressing all of those in order, as I said at the beginning of my talk, to not only give us our cake, the energy that we need, but to eat it too and to make a safer world and to reduce the emissions to the atmosphere as shown there. Because, as you've seen already, unfortunately, in my first slide, it's hard to find a good planet. It's the only one we have, and we want to keep living here in a wonderful, energy-efficient way, but we want to treat it with respect and uh, love its environment. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Final talk before the poster sessions, which uh, I think uh, Fiona plugged and I, I must say are quite lovely. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague uh, Eric Brewer. And let me just say a few words. Uh, he's my colleague in electrical engineering and computer science, but he has already sort of exemplified a lot of the things that we talked about. He has been an entrepreneur and founded Inc. to me and come back. And at the current time, he is the faculty director of the Intel Berkeley Lablet while continuing to be a professor at Berkeley. Are you all mic'd up? I think I'm all mic'd up. Please. And he's talking about technologies and infrastructures for emerging regions. Uh, so hopefully this is an update for many of you. I've spoken to Citrus groups on this topic in the past. And when I started giving these talks, it was about really the vision for why you needed technology for developing countries, uh, new technology. And I still believe in that vision. But the reason I was giving that talk is because I didn't actually have any results. So all I could talk about was what was possible. So today, I won't be talking about why we should be doing this so much, but I will be talking about results. Because after three years now, I'm happy to say we actually have some results, and they're pretty compelling. So this is the, the TIER project, which I lead. Uh, it's multidisciplinary with groups from uh, many parts of the campus, including uh, in particular EECS, but also uh, many different humanities and social sciences are represented. Uh, and and well, we have mostly NSF funding, but also funding from uh, Intel and Microsoft, Infineon and Vodafone, some of whom are here, thank you. Uh, and in particular, our basic uh, premise is that we need to create new options for developing countries uh, in, in what they can do with technology. Historically, technology is something that is simply comes from the quote-unquote first world, and if it's great, like a cell phone, and it happens to work for you, you can use it. But if it doesn't fit local needs, it, there's really no way to bridge that gap. Uh, so what we try to do is, is 
take a high-tech Silicon Valley style eye to the, the problems and see if we can address the problems directly with, with technology as one part of the solution. Uh, to do that, of course, you have to go to these places. So most of our work is in India, but we actually have work in several other countries as well. And our basic approach is simply you go there and you try to, to design with local folks and uh, implement with local folks uh, uh, solutions that are appropriate. And you really have to do this on a pretty fine-grained basis for a variety of reasons. We try to go back uh, every six months or more. Uh, and you have to kind of deliver every six months or more because, uh, frankly, when you go to a developing country and say, I have you know, all these great technologies I think you should use, they're reasonably skeptical. <laughs> and there's been a long history of people dropping into countries with great promises and little delivery. And so the ground is tainted. And because of that, what we end up doing is try to deliver something small in the first six months, right, as a kind of good faith effort to get us started. So the research agenda is quite broad. I won't go through all this, but it's just a picture of some of the things. Today I'll talk a little bit about uh, telemedicine and rural connectivity. I might get to uh, education and literacy, although we are going to try to get us back on schedule also. Uh, and we also have uh, work in power, including solar power, which I won't talk about, but it's certainly complementary to the many things that Paul just discussed. This is kind of our basic result, and I'll explain what it means. but. Uh, one of our goals is to get rural connectivity using low-cost Wi-Fi. So one way to do that is to take regular Wi-Fi that's cheap and get it to work over very long distances. This is the same Wi-Fi that you use in your laptop or in, in Starbucks or McDonald's. Um, and the red line kind of represents what kind of bandwidth you can get, bandwidth on the vertical axis and distance, uh, long distances. So you know, this N1, 300,000, that's 300 kilometers. All right, so can you get 300 kilometers? We're going to find out in January. We're going to go to Venezuela and try a 300-kilometer link. Uh, if we do, it will be the world record. Um, the, uh, the blue line is what we're getting it in simulation on our actual modified Wi-Fi. I can say that the, the simulated numbers are quite accurate as far as we can test them. Our longest link so far is about 60 kilometers. So we can go using regular Wi-Fi without power amplifiers, uh, using off-the-shelf regular Wi-Fi cards, 60 kilometers at high bandwidth. So that's a, an important uh, technical contribution. What, I'll show you what that means for telemedicine in a minute. Uh, what we've, this is kind of a summary of our best results, but essentially we have links in, in many countries, uh, in particular India and Berkeley and Ghana, but we also just set up stuff in Guinea-Bissau for community radio. Uh, our longest links are about 60 kilometers right now. Bandwidth is typically 4 to 6 megabits per second, but it can be as high as 18, we believe, going forward. It's very low power, which means that we can use a single solar panel to power these radios. That's very important. Uh, and the cost is low, mostly because the cost of uh, the high volume Wi-Fi parts is low. So the, the main result we have using this technology is rural telemedicine with the Aravan Eye Hospital. This is a hospital in uh, southern India. It's actually five hospitals uh, in the state of Tamil Nadu. And they understand their customer base quite well. And one thing they've realized is that uh, the limiting factor for their hospital is the distance people can walk to get to the hospital. So they have good patient coverage within about 15 to 20 kilometers. And outside that range, they simply don't get many patients because it's too far to walk. And walking has a bunch of problems. The obvious one is the, the distance, but also means uh, opportunity cost due to lost income if you have to travel or take transportation, assuming you can afford transportation. Typically, if you have vision problems, you have to take someone with you, so you have two lost incomes for that period. Uh, and, and if you know a little bit about India, you might also realize that India government agencies have this problem that you go to the government office and you, they may tell you to come back the next day, right? So there's no guarantee that when you get to this location, you'll actually get any eye care, right? So it's very important, we'll see when you do the video conference, one of the things that it provides is simply assurance that if you actually go to the hospital for treatment, we'll give you treatment. And by the way, it's free. Uh, so there's lots of need for blind, dealing with blindness, what they call needless blindness. These are uh, people that are suffering eye conditions that are completely preventable. The main causes are cataracts, but also glaucoma and diabetes. Um, most of this blindness is treatable, and most of it's in rural areas, and most of the people in rural areas, about, only about 7% get care. So there's a large group of untreated vision problems that are preventable. I should also mention that we've found, or the hospital has found, that if you can treat for say cataracts, 85% of the people that get treated actually return to income generation. 
So in fact, it's pretty important for the economy that you get people back to work. Uh, cataracts are the number two disability uh, in developing countries. So the goal is to, to build vision centers. What you see in this one is a one-room vision center with our little long-distance Wi-Fi link on top. It has an antenna on top, and that little white box is actually a, a Linux router with the Wi-Fi card inside. And that's what a typical deployment looks like. Uh, this is a map of, of the actual deployment. The hospitals in the middle, each of those green lines is a link. They vary in length from about 10 to 15 kilometers. Uh, you notice that, that some of the links have have two steps. Those are called multi-hop networks, and you can, in fact, use multiple hops to get to locations that are either around a hill or otherwise hard to get to. This is a typical vision center. It's, it's always one room. Um, it has two pieces of equipment, which is the PC, which has a, you know, a webcam and a microphone, and it has the slit-eye lens. Uh, there's one staff person who can think of essentially as a lightly trained nurse. Uh, she is the nurse, but she's also the administrator of the center, and she's also the pharmacist. So if the diagnosis is antibiotics, she'll actually dispense antibiotics. Um, she's typically a local village girl, which is important because she speaks the local dialect. And she may go to the hospital for training for about three to six months, but she's not trained beyond that. So we've been running this for about a year now, um, using the centers around this one hospital. And I'm happy to say we're treating about 2,000 patients per month. So these are real patients using the video conferencing. Uh, pretty even distribution of male and female patients. And I think one thing that's interesting is about 10% of the patients actually have a serious eye condition, meaning cataracts or glaucoma or diabetic retinopathy. Um, so about 10% are being referred to the hospital for, for surgery. So the, the, the value of the vision center, essentially what's going on here is it's essentially just a video conference between the doctor and the patient, although it's a high quality video conference and you, know, you can definitely see facial expressions and, and do, uh, it's a quality experience. The patients call it TV. I can see the doctor on TV is their, is their view of the system. We actually thought we would do other things such as sending JPEGs and vitals and things like that over the network. It turns out none of that's necessary. It's, the video conference is the thing that matters because if the patient hears something from the doctor, they'll take it seriously. In particular, if they get a little card that says, oh, you need cataract surgery, here's a card, take this to the hospital, you'll get cataract surgery for free. It turns out the card is unnecessary. They would get cataract surgery for free anyway, uh, but the card gives them some reassurance that they're being taken seriously. <laughs> right? So it's, it's for the patients, not for the system. Um, so 10% is a remarkable number because if we're seeing 2,000 patients a month, uh, that means a significant people, number of people already that are getting significant improvements in vision. So it's somewhere around 200 people per month are achieving significant vision improvement, such as cataract surgery or glaucoma treatment through this process. Um, another thing I want to point out is that there actually is revenue here. It's not a lot. It's about $460 a month. That may strike you as, as insignificant, but in fact, it's enough to make it sustainable, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Uh, what's the revenue come from? Well, the big one is actually the sale of eyeglasses, but there's a few other things too. The fees are not that big. It's about 25 cents to go, although what's interesting is it's 25 cents for seven visits. Why is that? Well, because if they make you pay per visit, you won't do your follow-ups. So you're prepaying for your follow-ups, essentially, as a way to encourage people to go, because the follow-ups are actually pretty important, and historically people aren't going for their follow-ups, so you need to encourage that. Uh, so you're only getting about $16 a day in income. So is that enough, right? Because this isn't going to work, at least I would argue, it's not going to work well if these centers are a money-losing proposition. So we want them to be financially sustainable. Uh, so we can estimate that. There's a setup cost. You have to get the space and the PC and the link. Uh, that's something on the order of less than $10,000. Uh, there's an operating cost, which is about $150 a month. That includes mostly the staff costs, but also the electricity. You have to pay the nurse and the electricity, and maybe some rent. Uh, can you break even? Yes, about two and a half years is our very early guess. So we don't have a lot of data yet, but it looks like even at $16 a day, uh, because the operating cost is lower than the monthly revenue, and because the capital cost is not that high, you can get this to break even in a reasonable amount of time. So we'll, we'll know more. But based on this, the hospitals decided that, in fact, it's, it's close enough to break even for them, and they're going to build 50 centers, of which they've got capital funding lined up for, I think, 24 more, uh, which they'll do in the next 18 months. 
assuming you get to 50 vision centers, it's about 10,000 patients per center per year. So about half a million patients would get examined using the system uh, at that scale. And then this is just for the five hospitals. So in fact, if you scale this up to the rest of India, which again is quite achievable, I think, is a reasonable uh, you know, kind of decade goal, you should be able to treat most of the needless blindness in India using this approach. Uh, and the hope, of course, is if you can treat uh, half a million patients at the, in the 10% num number stays, that's 50,000 people that are going to have significant life-changing vision improvement, including new income generation per year. Uh, these are just some of the patients. I point them out just to uh, remind people that this is, not, <laughs> this is actually not a lab. This is real patients whose livelihood depends on uh, eye treatment. The guy in the middle uh, actually has had cataracts for seven years. We asked him, well, why didn't you go to the hospital? And he said, well, you know, I didn't know if I'd get treated. It seemed hard to do. It's far away. Right? Now the vision center is here. He's gotten treated, and, his, and you know, it's a completely different life. Uh, good, we have a little bit of time. Uh, another topic I'll pick on a little bit, in part because we have some of the posters represented here. So there will be a poster on the Aravind work. There will also be posters on um, games, which is the second bullet on this slide, and also a, a multiple mice demo, multiple mice poster. So just real briefly, this kind of get the, f the feeling of some of these projects. The multiple mice per, C, per, C, per PC project is, is really quite... Uh, clever. It just comes to the observation, if you look at PCs in schools, what we found is that it's typically five to ten children using the same PC. That's because you, there aren't, aren't enough PCs, so therefore you have to have a lot of users per PC. Of course, PCs weren't designed for this, um, so what we tried is, well, what if we give each student their own mouse? Does that improve the learning experience? The reasons to think it would simply are that all the students are now engaged, and if you're engaged, you're more likely to learn. The short answer is early results are we are seeing better education, particularly for boys, uh, this is primary education, uh, when each boy has his own mouse. For girls, it seems to matter less, and we can figure out why that is. I have some guesses, but no hard evidence. Um, we also have some evidence that, that computers in schools lead to lower attrition, that the parents value the symbolic value of the computer regardless of its educational value, <laughs> right? Now, that may not be sustainable, but has no educational value. Presumably, they'll value it less in the future. But in part because of the success of the IT industry in India, almost all parents have a high value of computing and view that as a reason for students to go to school. And it looks like the attrition rates are lower in schools that have PCs, although, again, very early result. Um, English is a second language, it turns out, to, is a very important part of education. It's the, the part of education that's actually most in demand. So if you ask a parent in India, what are your criteria for how you, what school you might pick, English is probably the number one criteria. Computers actually would be a high criteria also, it looks like. We haven't asked them that. But it's pretty clear English, primary education in English is the number one criteria for school selection. So in fact, you can even argue that English language literacy or knowledge is, in some sense, what determines what class you're in effectively. That English is the ticket to, to being middle class or above. Uh, so what we're looking at is how can we do a better job of teaching English as a second language using cell phones, in part because the cell phones are, are quite present and in part because they're a good uh, immersive environment that might be more effective than just the formal education process for learning English. So we'll have a poster on that. Uh, actually using games because games tend to have a high, uh, students are willing to pay attention to games. So we're trying to find the match of games that are fun to play, that teach English well enough that kids will continue to use them uh, for an extended period of time. And finally, we're doing a lot of work on speech recognition for languages other than English uh, as a way to deal with illiterate or semi-literate populations uh, and, and also as a way, frankly, to help preserve some of the 6,000 languages that are in use on this planet that are, are nowhere close to having regular speech recognition. Uh, so all of the work in speech recognition so far has essentially been on a few languages, such as English, uh, and it's, you know, therefore they don't apply to most speakers in the world. So we're looking at ways we can do language recognition or speech recognition that is not only speaker independent, so it will work with different speakers, but it's in some sense language independent, so that it will work with many different languages. 
And the, the trick we're going to play there is, of course, that we're not going to be able to do things like dictation or translation. Those require deep understanding of the language. But if you want to have an interactive session, such as uh, deciding what's the price of a particular crop, that kind of interaction that's, that's more focused, you can do with a small vocabulary and looks to be achievable with a general language independent speech recognizer. All right, so I will basically just show you one picture of interesting research that came up. This is from Madeleine Plouchet, who did the work. How do you actually collect data to, to learn how to recognize speech from illiterate speakers? This has never been studied before. The normal way you do training for speech recognition is you have people read the word out loud. But if they can't read, they can't read the word out loud. And you can't tell them the word verbally because then they'll mimic what you said, which is not what you want either. You want them to say it how they would naturally say it. Uh, you also notice, if you look closely, that she's speaking into a phone instead of a microphone. Why is that? Well, in my mind, that's at least in part because uh, it's more, more comfortable for the speaker. Microphones are a little bit scary, whereas the phone is a little bit more friendly. <laughs> and again, you don't want to disturb the natural speech pattern. Why are there Indians doing the, the questioning? Because it's, they're locals and they're more comforting. Right? So there's a lot of issues in this picture alone of how do you get speech recognition to work for unusual language, particularly for illiterate speakers. This is a typical application window. I won't go through it, but basically this is a way to get information about agricultural crops and, and techniques using a spoken interface. Uh, and you can, you, don't, you can read the words, but if you don't read the words, you can use the pictures or you can listen. Uh, it plays sounds that, that describe, and then you say the word that, that goes with the picture to actually do selection. So it'll highlight, the middle box is highlighted because that one's been selected. So we're building applications that allow you to interact uh, with the computer using entirely this speech recognition. All right, so we have actually three posters today, two on education and one on the telemedicine. Uh, and I'll stop here. The website's at the bottom is the best place for ongoing information. And that leaves me three minutes for questions and getting us back on schedule. <laughs> We do have room, <coughs> time for questions, and again, we have people with microphones. <laughs> Very impressive. You showed an interesting photograph of a tower, uh, vertical, with the Linux router, Wi-Fi, and the antenna. Right. Uh, what's the lifetime that's been up? What kind of environmental impacts, rain, sun? Uh, so far, our longest ones have only been up maybe a year or two. Um, so I don't think we have a full answer. I can say the very first enclosure we did was a plastic box that we got locally and it disintegrated in six months. In fact, the, the router broke and we didn't know why until we actually went there and realized that the, that it had, it had been, uh, the board had been fried due to water which came in because the box had disintegrated. So uh, there's actually a big need for all kinds of solutions on enclosures and lightning and mechanical engineering, broadly speaking. Great opportunity. Thank you. In fact, there's needs. I have a long list of needs in many fields. <laughs> I heard there's a question over there, but I, I don't see it. On your last graphic that you showed with the voice recognition research being done on agricultural processes and the like, where, where is that being done? That's in Tamil Nadu, and the language is Tamil. Um, and, uh, but again, it, the, it, that, we have another piece of work that's actually quite related, which is kind of like a, a speak and spell game, if people remember speak and spell, where within one hour you can create this learning game for any language that, you know, a non-IT person can, tr can convert the game to work for their language in about an hour. So it is in Tamil, but there's nothing about Tamil that we're exploiting in that uh, application. So it should work for any language. Madeline Koshe is here. Madeline might be here. I don't actually, I can't see with the lights on. Here in, in the sense she's in Berkeley. She's in Berkeley, but she also might be here today. <laughs> <'cause>, <laughs> uh, but if she's not, I'm certainly should be happy to talk to anyone about the particular applications. But right now it's in Tamil Nadu using the Tamil language. Right. It was right there. <coughs> Uh, for the Citrix buildings, are you going for LEED certification, and are you able to use the buildings themselves as test beds? I think you're talking to him. Yeah, so <laughs> fine. We're going to use it 
we're going to put antennas on top of it, but that's probably not what you're asking. <laughs> in terms of the energy, the energy efficiency element, uh, it isn't going to be quite up to that standard. The better person to ask maybe is uh, Dean Jeff Wright, who had uh, said lead build the buildings there are lead buildings. So, so the answer is, I think that perhaps at Berkeley we'll be doing a few things. I think things like tier and putting antennas and all that is easy. But uh, Jeff Wright, who is here as the Dean of Engineering from Merced. All of our buildings are LEED certified. And all of the UC Merced buildings are LEED certified silver, and we're hoping for one at a higher LEED certification soon. That's a great answer. To I have just a simple question. Where do you see the application for more developed countries in the improvement of healthcare? Uh, actually, one of the things, too, for, so I've given the telemedicine talk in more detail to a couple groups in the U.S. Uh, the two that have the most traction, we'll see where they go, uh, is Indian Health Services, which is the group of the, the agency of the federal government responsible for health care on Indian reservations. They already do some telemedicine, but they don't really have good connectivity uh, choices. They use very expensive satellite connectivity right now and we have a chance because of the distances we can cover to greatly reduce their costs. Um, the other one that's had some traction is the, the state of Virginia, I guess the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, has a telemedicine program in place. Uh, uh, Southern Virginia is relatively rural. Uh, and some, if you know West Virginia, it's pretty similar to Southern Virginia. Um, and they border each other. Uh, they would like to extend their existing rural telemedicine program to actually be more rural than it is because they don't have a good way, again, to get high bandwidth video quality connectivity to a lot of the rural parts of the state. So we may do a pilot with them also. I think broadly speaking, there is no good global solution for rural connectivity in any country. This is the best I know of. It would make sense to try it in the U.S. as well. But less necessary in the U.S. because of satellite. Satellite works in rural areas. It's just very expensive. It's too expensive for developing countries. Hi, quick question about uh, working with the NGOs in India to understand the ground realities. What are the filters you're using to select the NGOs you're working with? That's number one. And secondly, um, I mean there are lots of complexities uh, even in the bottom of the pyramid. I mean. It, it's made out to be a uniform thing, but it, there are lots of complexities there. So how do you get to understand that, even for the education right. game, depend, you know, depending on which sector? So it's, that's a great question. There's a lot of complicated answers. That. Just, so first let me just say, that the general notion at the bottom of the pyramid is that it's homogenous, which is completely ridiculous. In fact, I think the whole, the whole the, really the entire thought process at the bottom of the pyramid is flawed because of its assumption of homogeneity. It's really misleading for that reason. Um, that being said, we, what we end up doing is, of course, is individual projects with individual NGOs in individual locations, and that's the only way to do them, and those, of course, all of those are by definition localized. Answering your broader question of how do we pick NGOs, uh, it's not easy. We did a, I think we're good at it now. We weren't good at it at first, but we actually had a few students, again, some of whom might be here, that interviewed, I believe, 80 different groups in our first year, partially to figure out what kind of good projects there were to do, but also to figure out how do you find good partners. The good news is there are many NGOs throughout the world that have long public track records with relatively high transparency, not because of any local things, but because they tend to get funding from international groups that require some transparency. So you can find good NGOs, as far as I can tell, in every country if you look. And of course, you have to pick projects that align with their mission or they won't really support it for very long. Right? You can't make them stretch into some new area. And that's kind of a problem because there aren't really many technical, techni technology savvy NGOs. So you have to pick ones that want to be technology savvy and help them get there. But if they don't want it, you can't fix it. <laughs> right. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing in Africa? Uh, we are doing uh, a couple different things in Africa. The most uh, work we've done so far has been in Ghana. We're looking at healthcare in Ghana, including um, telemedicine, but also actually using cell phones as the uh, rural device for nurses. Uh, it turns out that you'd actually like to have data collection capabilities for disease detection, for even for basic things like why do, why do kids die? It's not typically known. Uh, and if you don't know why kids die, you can't correctly allocate resources. So in fact, in Tanzania, there was a study where they, all they did was collect 
reasonably good surveys of why kids were dying, they changed the allocation of resources and reduced the child mortality rate from 16% to 9%. So that's a 40% reduction over a five-year period. All right, so there's lots of room for cell phones, I think, as computer, portable computers, essentially, not as communications devices. That's wide open. We'll be trying that in Africa. And also, I think we're in the middle of trying to find a, a quite large project with the government of Rwanda. Rwanda is a nice country to work with for a couple reasons, but one is it's small and it is possible to do national projects in Rwanda because it's, it's small. Uh, and also the particular government, uh, you know, people think of it as a violent place, it's actually an amazingly safe place at the moment, a good place to send graduate students, uh, and um, has a, a, essentially a benevolent dictator that makes it a pretty good place to get things done. Right. It's not a democracy, although they have elections scheduled in 2010. We'll see if they happen. They probably will happen in some form. Uh, but ignoring the, the dictatorship part, it's, a, it's a, quite a solid, efficient, well-run country and, and has, believes that IT is its, is its future path. And so that there, we'll see where that goes. All right. All right. If there are no more questions, I'd like to do just one more thing as in closing. So I'd like to... I have, I'm mic'd up. <laughs> I'd like to propose that I, I understood that Rich Newton is perhaps watching this on the, on the computer. It's being webcast and so on and so forth. So I propose that we give a really wonderful round of applause for Rich to having gotten us all on this wonderful journey and to thank him for having gotten us here so far. So let's be very rich.